Alrighty, folks. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are in the current boot camp, uh, the check-in message is in our boot camp channel. Go ahead and check that. Uh, and then the question to start today. The question to start today is, would you instantly rather be the greatest triangle player that ever lived, like the ding 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 ding, ding triangle, or would you rather 250k cash instantly in your hand? It looks like a good mix so far. We got a good mix. We got a lot of cash. I think the cash is kind of overwhelming it now. 250 cash is kind of there. Still a lot of triangle players though, too. Cool. Welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, so today is going to be the first day of our free web development bootcamp for those affected by the pandemic. Uh, we have a cohort of 60 individuals that are actually going through the bootcamp with live homework grading and things like that. But anyone can feel free to follow along with the lectures that we have here and feel free to ask questions in our discord channel. If you don't have access to discord, go ahead and type exclamation point. We call it bang discord into chat and it'll give you the link to our discord channel uh, there are a bunch of mentors that are in that discord that are ready to help you if you get stuck as we move through everything if you want the slides to follow along you can just do exclamation point slides in the chat as well uh, and that will bring you to the live uh, version of the slides meaning that as i progress through the slides uh, you'll see the slide progression as well so you don't kind of have to hop around or anything like that Cool. So yeah, so go ahead. I'm going to give folks a few seconds to kind of get in here, to get the slides up, to go ahead and get the materials that they might need as well. If you're following along as well, in the Discord channel, there's going to be a follow along materials channel. Uh, once you register, that follow along materials channel is not only going to have the slides, uh, but it's also going to have the two HTML files you'll need. Uh, we'll have one code along that you'll use that HTML file for. And then there'll be another HTML file that's specifically for the lab. So at the end of today's uh, lecture, we're going to stop. We're going to take a little bit of a break and then we're going to work on a lab. Uh, and you're going to take some time to work through that lab. And then that's actually going to be the homework that's due next Tuesday. So if you're not already in the Discord and you want those two HTML files, go ahead and join. Uh, it's really easy. Just bang Discord, exclamation Discord in the slides, uh, sorry, in the chat, and go to the follow along materials channel. That's where the materials will be. Cool. Thank you everyone for joining. It's gonna be fun. I'm excited. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take a sip out of my Hufflepuff mug. It's kind of green screened out to get people typing, what's your Harry Potter house? I'm a Hufflepuff for sure. Just trying to give folks a few more minutes to get in here. I would assume a lot of Ravenclaws are gonna be in chat today. Yeah, all right, Ravenclaws won it. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't even, that wasn't even close. <laughs> All right, now the people are coming. The Slytherins are too cool for school. They're they're now coming into chat. Cool. Uh, I've been a Pokemon master for a very long time. Uh, fun fact: uh, this channel was the reason why I have like over a thousand followers is because this used to be my Pokemon channel. Uh, I was so there's there's probably a few confused folks being like, who the heck is Leon and why is he trying to teach me some web development? Uh, but this was originally my Pokemon channel. Uh, I was the first person to live stream Pokemon Go outside. So I had like a camera on my hat and I was walking around. So there's a one or two weird VODs somewhere floating on the Internet of me uh, walking around downtown Boston trying to catch Pokemon when Pokemon Go first came out. Uh, so that's where the Pokemon Master comes from. Been a Pokemon Master for a while. Uh, but I get to make up the slides. So I'm going to put whatever I want. And today I'm a Pokemon Master. Uh, I used to have 
uh, a challenge that I throw that I throw down. So during the day, uh, I teach uh, for a nonprofit coding boot camp called Resilient Coders, and then at night, often I have a, another boot camp that I help teach uh, at General Assembly. Uh, for the longest time, I used to always throw down a challenge to anybody going through those boot camps, and the challenge was if you beat me in a Pokemon battle, I would immediately pass you for the course, like. Doesn't matter. Instant pass. You can do whatever you want the rest of the boot camp and we'll be good. Uh, the downside was if you lost the Pokemon battle, you had to do double the work just to pass. Right. So I had four people take me up on the offer. They all lost viciously. It was a problem. Uh, and they had to do double the work. And there's nothing to do about it. So that, that's where the Pokemon Master really comes from back in the day. All right. It seems like most folks have checked in. Remember, if you're in the actual cohort that's right now, we have our private bootcamp channel. Uh, there's a green check mark you have to hit and a special message to put into chat. For everyone else that's following along, once before we kind of get started, uh, you can join the Discord to get access to not only the materials, uh, but also some live help as well. So I'll be following along looking at the questions that come through in our chat channel on Discord, and I'll be looking at some of the, the questions here on Twitch as well. All right, I'm gonna join uh, the private bootcamp channel uh, so I can hear folks answer, answer questions in real time. I think we're all good. It seems like most folks have checked in. Are we ready to get started? Should we just get started? Yeah, let's get started. All right, so I'm gonna switch over to the slide and I'm gonna go mini me for now. Uh, we're going to work through tonight a few things. So let's go through the agenda first. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is software engineering as a career, web development as a career, uh, I would love to kind of answer any of the questions you might have about kind of what it takes to break into tech, uh, what it what it takes to kind of get that first role as a developer. Uh, then we're going to talk about the internet and specifically something called the client server model. We're going to spend some time doing a simple code along. We're going to talk about some HTML. Uh, we're going to learn about all the HTML basics and then we should move into a lab. I'm expecting class to take anywhere from about two to three hours, including that lab time, uh, about two hours of us talking and then about an hour of actual lab time. Cool. So yeah, so there, there is a private bootcamp channel. Remember I took a cohort of 60 people. Uh, we had over 2000 people that applied. So I'm answering your questions in the discord and Twitch chat. Uh, but the folks that got in for this first run of the program, uh, they're also in a private channels where I can give them a little bit more attention, grade homework, things like that. The beautiful thing is they got in this round, but the wonderful thing is you can get in next round and it'll probably be better because I'll work out all the kinks. All right. So. Let's jump right into it. Let's start talking about software engineering as a career. Uh, I would love to answer some of your questions around that before we kind of get started uh, in the actual agenda for the day. So learning to code right now is the current gold rush. Everyone wants to learn how to code and there's some pretty good reasons why. Uh, there's really high pay. Uh, if you look up uh, software engineering, software developer, uh, you will see base salaries that seem pretty wild, anywhere from 70 to a little bit over 100,000 for like entry level software engineers uh, in pretty much every major city. Of course, if you look in places like Boston or the Bay Area, those salaries can get really, really wild. Uh, but when we look at across the country, anywhere from like 70 to 100K seems to be like the starting rate for somebody that goes after a software engineering title. Uh, and so, it's good pay. Uh, it is, if you Google like Google happiest career, right? Uh, yeah, I, I would uh, mute I, on Discord. Actually, let me see if I can mute myself on Discord. Sorry, one second, folks. Uh, one, the first one, we're kind of working out the kinks here together. Uh, I'm gonna switch my voice to push to talk. There you go. So I am now muted on Discord and just talking on Twitch. Cool. Uh, great pay. 
If you literally Google happiest career, software developer or some mutation of it shows up. Uh, and it's been like that way for the past three or four years. And then the other cool thing is that you don't need a degree to become a software engineer. You can actually learn all of this stuff entirely for free. Uh, and maybe you wind up with a slide in your office like uh, Ticketmaster does. So it's very appealing, especially for folks that maybe are affected by the pandemic right now, maybe are laid off, lost their job. It seems like a really great step forward for maybe a career shift. Uh, the real numbers that I have, that I see for real on a daily basis, is I run a free nonprofit coding bootcamp during the day called Resilient Coders. We're a great team. We've been working on this for about four years now to get the program to where it is today. Uh, the graduates of our program, if you look at the past 12 months, 85% uh, of them after they graduate, so it's not 100%, 85% of them go on to get starting salaries of $98,000 or more. Uh, and these are individuals that typically don't have a degree and for the most part really haven't touched code prior to joining a 20 week boot camp, And in those 20 weeks, they're able to learn enough to get their first job as a software engineer. Uh, and so we've had hundreds of people go through that program so I can see it on a daily basis like it works, right? They put in a metric crap ton of work. I'm talking about 12 hour days for 20 weeks. And at the end, only 85% of them actually get full-time offers, right? So it's possible. You can do it. It's going to take a whole lot of work if you want to do it well. Uh, there are a lot of folks that learn the code on their own, totally able to do that. There are so many free resources, free code camp, the Odin project, uh, numerous courses that you can find online uh, for free and paid that you can learn on your own. For folks that want to learn on their own, there's two things I always say that's really important. One, you have to learn how to learn, right? Being a software engineer or a web developer, whatever you want to call it, and we'll break that down in a second, is signing up for a lifelong time of solving hard problems, figuring out how to get unstuck when you're stuck, right? and pushing through all those really, really rough moments, right? That's what, that's what it means to be a software engineer, right? So you have, to, you have to learn how to learn really well. And then the second thing is finding a community of folks that can help you get unstuck. I've literally created learning plans for 200 individuals. People that came to me and said, hey, Leon, I wanna learn how to code. 200 plus people I've built learning plans for. The number of folks that actually execute and push through to learn is very low. And the number one thing I often see why people don't actually push through is they get stuck and there's no way to get unstuck. So finding that community is really important. Uh, we have our Discord channel. I hope you use that to get unstuck. But there are so many other communities online, Discord channels, IRC channels, people that are willing to help you get unstuck, that if you can find that community that fits for you, there's going to be the biggest things to help you get unstuck and continue to learn, right? So it's a great career. It's high paying. It's technically one of the happiest. You don't need a degree to do it. Uh, and you can learn it for free, right? Uh, somebody had a really good question in, in, the, in, in, in the Twitch chat. Is this boot camp something worth mentioning on your resume? Sure. Why not? Uh, one of the things, though, that's really important to understand is no certificate, no boot camp graduation, nothing that you do that gives you a piece of paper is going to be enough to get a job. Nobody's ever going to look at your resume and go, oh, you completed that boot camp, one job, please, and give you the job. They really care about two things. Can you code? Right. And do I want to work with you for the next two years? That's kind of what it breaks down to. Right. And so the, the hard thing is uh, that that learning how to code part. Right. If you can if you can code, you can find a job. Now, the process for finding a job is pretty intense. Uh, the students I see that are successful treat that job hunt with even more rigor than they did learning how to code. Um, but it's possible. 
But I, the, the thing is that there's kind of like a traps out there right now. People trying to sell you on certificates, trying to sell you on things that don't necessarily guarantee you in a job. Right. So you can learn all this on your own. You can learn it all for free. Um, there is what I like to show first. The trough of sorrow. So here's the trough of sorrow. It comes from the startup world. And what it's actually doing is, is here. Here's how like, I like to break it down. You have initial excitement, right? Initial excitement is I'm going to learn how to code. I'm going to take the time out of my day to, to grind out and, and really push myself to learn deep. And so this is where most people start. This is where probably you all are right now, right at the beginning of it. Then what happens is you buy 20 Udemy courses that aren't going to help you because you're so excited. I just hurt somebody right there because you're so excited, right? And then you're on the very tip of excitement. And then you start putting in the work, right? And the excitement starts to fade, starts to fade, starts to fade. And then you are studying every day for weeks, for months. And we like to call that the trough of sorrow, right? It's, 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 it's the time from when you got really excited about learning how to code to the time before you start to feel like you got a hang on it, right? Right? Before you start to feel like you got a hang on it. And then once, once you start to feel like you have a hang on it, you have these little dips that go down and the dips that go up. And it, it's kind of like you're almost there, right? You're almost there. And then eventually you struggle a little bit more and you make it to the promised land. That process where you go from initial excitement to like actually landing a job, I would say can happen anywhere from 12 weeks to a year, right? Depending on how much time you have to throw at it. The students that go through my boot camp during the day, right? They put in 12 hour days for 20 weeks and only 85% of them are successful. So you can't trick yourself into saying, hey, I'm going to study for two hours, a couple days a week and expect a, a magical job to happen. There are a lot of folks that dedicate a lot of time to this and it, it kind of doesn't phase out because it takes it takes time. It's, it's not magic. And, th and that's kind of what I want people to, to realize uh, because there's there's some some bad people out there right now. There are some folks that are trying to sell this dream, right? They see the gold rush and they're not mining for gold, but they want to show you the shovel. They want to sell you the pan and you got to be careful. You got to watch out for that, right? But it is possible. It is doable. And so I'm hoping that this five week course will give you enough of an introduction to kind of understand like what software engineering is, what web developers specifically do on a day-to-day -day basis and see if maybe it might be something for you, right? This course isn't gonna be a course that gets you your job. Um, no course really is that. This course is really just meant for you to explore, for you to have a space to ask lots of questions, uh, a space for when you're working through coding, you get stuck, you have some people that are gonna help you get unstuck. And I'm really hoping that for folks that were laid off by the pandemic or affected in some way, shape or form, that this could be the starting point for a new career, okay? It's a lot to start with, some heavy topics there. Let's talk about what a software engineer does right? Just briefly, and then I'll answer some questions you might have. So software engineers, right? Write code. And so what is code, right? Code is really just simple sets of instructions for a computer to follow, right? So when you are coding or programming, you're writing those instructions for the computer to follow. Now, those instructions could tell the computer to render a website that you see in front of you. That code could turn on a coffee machine, right? Those instructions, you can, you can write them to, to do whatever you want. When it comes to something specific as web development, 
you can still have the title of software developer, software engineer, and specialize in web development. Instead of focusing on the software that runs on, say, your desktop computer or your coffee machine, you're going to focus on the code that runs in a web browser like Chrome or Safari or Firefox, right? The code that the users can see and interact with the code that powers the websites that you visit every day. Web development is a great first step into learning how to code, mainly because it's so visual and tactile. Everyone uses a website. You can build something and show your friends. You can build something that's useful and can make money and, and all these wonderful things. So for a lot of folks, they start with web development, right? It's a pretty clean, straightforward path into software engineering. There are a lot of jobs and it's pretty well established how to get there. Like there are really great tutorials. There are boot camps that you can participate in that'll get you over the hump of the things that you need to learn. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're gonna, we're gonna start exploring. We're gonna start exploring web development, code that runs in the browser and that powers the websites that we interact with on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Cool. Do you have any questions so far? Questions about learning to code? Questions about software engineering in general? I just wanted to add this in the front just because I know some folks are, are thinking about it. Uh, and as we go through today's lecture, it'll make more sense like what coding is, what programming is, and then maybe we can come back to this. Any boot campers uh, in the Discord have any questions so far? Cool. So this is this is supposed to be structured as a class, right? So I'm going to stop. I'm going to pause. There's going to be some dead air. I want you to respond. I want you know, I want you to answer, right? Uh, and so let's let's start taking some of these questions. All right. Do you have a suggested starting place? Yes. Free Code Camp. Free Code Camp. Uh, it is completely free. Has a wonderful community built around it, and it will very much hold your hand through the basics through HTML, through CSS, uh, through JavaScript. And then once you know the basics, stop and build something. Doesn't matter what it is. Stop and build something. You pick whatever your hobby is and build a website or that, that, that helps or supports that hobby, right? If you really like brownies, build a website about brownies, right? Don't get caught up in tutorial hell, right? Learn enough to feel comfortable, just enough, and then start building. So that's where I recommend to start. If you want to start with HTML and CSS, start with, uh, with free code camp. It's completely free. Don't pay money. Don't pay money in the beginning. No Udemy course is gonna be worth the money when you're first starting out. There are so many free resources. Don't get the dopamine hit of saying, all right, I'm gonna buy this so that I feel good about my starting of the journey. No, there's so much free stuff. You don't need to pay money to start out, especially in the beginning. All right, uh, I have another great question here uh, in the Discord. How did I learn how to code? Uh, so my learning to code was is an interesting journey. Uh, I went to college for biology, biological anthropology. Uh, I actually dropped out my senior year to start a company, but I'll get to that. Uh, the first line of code I ever wrote was in QBasic in sixth grade. Uh, I was super fortunate in sixth grade to have a computer science class. Like what blows my mind to think about it. Uh, I made a sailboat go from one side of the screen to the other using QBasic. I like lost my mind. Like I really lost my shit. I thought I had magical powers that I made this boat go across the screen. Uh, so that was my very first line of code. Uh, I went to an engineering high school in Philly uh, and I actually had C++ classes throughout high school. Another like, wow, like I was so super lucky to have that. Uh, I went to Yale. Uh, when I was at Yale, I completely didn't think about code until maybe my sophomore year, uh, no, actually my junior year. I had been dabbling building little websites here or there, um, but my, my junior year, I moved off campus and I was hungry. Uh, I didn't have honestly money for food. Uh, and so I went on Craigslist and I said, hey, I'll build you a website uh, if you pay me. Uh, the person responded, they paid a deposit and I took that money and I skipped all the way to the grocery store to buy pasta and pasta sauce. Uh, once that happened, I immediately knew that like, wait a minute, I have this skill. Somebody will pay me for it. 
Uh, and that's when it all started clicking. I got really interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, I started a scientific surveying company. We had thousands of universities that used our software to power their research. Uh, hundreds of academic articles that were published using our software. And I was surrounded by some really brilliant engineers. And I, I wanted to be as good as they were. Uh, I'm still not, but I, I want it to be. And so I really started pushing myself to learn. Uh, I really started making sure my nights and weekends were filled with building cool projects, building other side companies, uh, and then kind of wrapped up that company about four years ago uh, and joined Resilient Coders to kind of lead instruction in their classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. And so every day I write code, uh, every day uh, I'm doing coding challenges. I'm on day 56 in a row of pushing a code challenge to GitHub. Uh, so that's kind of my path to learning this. Uh, and the thing for me is that coding has always been a means of putting food on the table, right? Money in my pocket. And I really want that for all of my students and for all of you that are kind of going through the things you're going through now. Yeah. Yeah. I recommend the basics of HTML and CSS and then stopping, build something, have fun with it. Like see if you actually really enjoy this. And then once you know you actually enjoy it, then go hardcore, then find better tutorials, find things that can really push you and help your growth. Uh, if you join our Discord, uh, I, I, I am pretty active on that one. If you need suggestions on what to study next, uh, how to do this for free, uh, definitely jump in there and I'm happy to answer those questions. Yeah, I, I agree. I, the people that you surround yourself is really important. If you can find a study group that like pushes you to study, uh, I have a study group that just actually went off the ground today. Uh, we're gonna work through some of MIT's uh, open computer science courses and we're gonna meet every Monday and work through them. Uh, that's why I say community is so important early on, right? If you can find a good community, it's gonna help push you and help you get unstuck. That's, that's gonna be the, the real difference maker early on. Do you need CSS, HTML, and JavaScript to start building? You just need HTML and C you really only just need HTML to start building. CSS and JavaScript will come a little bit later on. Uh, there have been a lot of folks that are probably are somewhat new to this and might not know what HTML, and CSS, and JavaScript are and what we're talking about. Uh, we're gonna get into that a little bit further on uh, once we get into the slides. Uh, but I wanna, I wanna stop and answer that question so we kind of have a good idea. So I like to imagine that I'm going to order a pizza from Domino's. I'm not actually gonna do it. I'm no longer allowed to order pizza from Domino's. Uh, and I don't want my wife to find out because she's probably gonna watch these videos. So we're gonna use our imagination and pretend to order uh, some pizza on Domino's.com. I'm gonna pretend I'm ordering it from my phone. Uh, the real reason why I'm not allowed to order Domino's is uh, when you're walking down the street and the Domino's delivery guy like pulls over, gets out of his car, grips you up, says, hey, Leon, how's it going? And he's not actually delivering you a pizza. That's the exact moment you're no longer allowed to order Domino's pizza. So we're going to use our imaginations. If we were to go to Domino's.com, you would see a delicious pizza, right? And a list of ingredients that are going down the page. That image, that content, that text, those things that you see, all that content is powered by HTML, okay? Now, the peppers are green, the pineapple is yellow, the ham is pink, it, it, the, the things are centered, right? The coloring, the style, the positioning, that's all powered by CSS. So if you've ever been to a website and you saw something, like you saw content, that's HTML. If it looked good and not like a hot mess, that's CSS. But the holy grail, like I hope this person got a raise of Domino's website, is that you can drag, right? You can drag the ingredients onto the pizza. What? You can drag the ingredients onto the pizza. That behavior, that interaction, that's powered by JavaScript. So if you've ever been to a website and you saw something, HTML, if it looked good and was styled nicely, that's CSS. And if you were able to do something, click, interact with it, uh, that's all JavaScript. 
So those are the really, yeah. Yo, Domino's, you want to sponsor, come at me. Uh, I would love to have you involved. Um, we've got a lot of hungry people here. A lot of people are trying to eat while they're studying. So let's go. Let's go. Let's make it happen. Uh, those are where you want to start, right? Because with that, you can build pretty much every site that you've ever seen and interacted with, right? You can, you can get content that is visible and, and interact with it. When things break, you see it. There's, there's no ambiguity to it. It's all there. It's tactile. It's real. Uh, so that's why I tell people to start with HTML and CSS and then add a little bit of JavaScript after you start building. It, it, it's just, it just has like a really good reinforcement loop. You can see as things are going and how things are happening. Yeah. <laughs> if we know anything about Leon, we know he loves his dominoes. That is true. Loved. It's a past tense now. I don't want to get in trouble. Cool. Any questions while we're here? Yeah, I'm definitely an Android guy. <laughs> an old flame. Do you need math to be a good programmer? Hell no. Can it help? Hell yes. Um, especially in the beginning, especially with web development, um, it's not a lot of hardcore math. If you want to get into like machine learning or VR, yeah, you're going to run into it. Do I use math on a, on a, on a somewhat regular basis? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Like it, 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 does, it does help. Um, but here's what I did. I have a very good short-term memory, like very good. Um, it's how I got through school was all based on my short-term memory. Once I started programming and I wanted to get into some more meaty stuff, I realized that I didn't have that strong of a math ability. So I started with Khan Academy. I went all the way back to the basics. I started with like first grade. I got all the way up to like seventh grade before I realized I didn't know fractions anymore. <laughs> I just couldn't, I like you multiply, for, I don't remember. So I, I took time to go through it. Then I went through Khan Academy's like, uh, they're like more like high school level math. Uh, I bought a book, you can teach yourself math and walk through that. And now I feel pretty comfortable with it. And when I run into some mathy stuff, uh, I'm, I'm not afraid anymore. So I, I worked through it, but I, I honestly, in web development, I don't use math super frequently like on a regular basis now there's gonna be some other developers in the chat that are just like losing their minds no i use math all the time yeah you can but for building websites and web applications i don't really run into it honestly that much but i do respect the folks that are that are good at it um i'm also i also always had the opinion that i was bad at math and i just realized i had really bad study habits uh and so once i learned how to learn better math became a little bit easier uh, if you're in our Discord, I'm going to share uh, a couple of resources on how to learn well. Uh, one of my favorite courses of all time is on Coursera for free called Learning How to Learn. Um, Barbara Oakley, I believe, she also wrote a book about it. Uh, it just, it's just a really good way to start framing like how to learn. And then there's one really big thing that folks really take for granted in uh, computer science, uh, especially in computer science learning, and that's spaced repetition. There's this, uh, there's something called the forgetting curve. Once you learn material, the forgetting curve is pretty steep. Like you kind of forget it pretty quickly, like within a day, but you can use space repetition tools so that your forgetting curve keeps getting reset. Basically, um, you, you just see the material again, a few days later, a few hours later, and it resets the forgetting curve. And eventually the forgetting curve flattens out. Uh, and so there has been some really good studies that that kind of test these methods. Um, and if you like YouTube, like evidence based study tips, you'll find these. But the really big one, the one that really changed how I thought and why I needed to learn how to learn better was that they gave a reading assignment to four different groups of people. One group reread the one chapter they had to read four times and the other group read it once and then actively recalled the things they just learned. Like they, like they read the chapter and then they said out loud all the things that they had just learned. The group that read out loud the things that they had just learned did better than the group that read the material four times. That blew my mind. I was like, why is this not taught day one 
right? Day one of college, day one of high school. It's a, it's a shame. Uh, so definitely recommend learning how to learn. And the tool that you're seeing people type in the chat is called Anki. Uh, Anki is the tool I use for spaced repetition. It's completely free. There's a theme here, folks. You can do this for free. Don't spend money, please, especially in the beginning. Um, you can do it for free. Uh, it's Anki. It's like, um, it's, it's kind of like flash flashcards, but it, it has an algorithm behind it that knows when you're going to forget stuff. So if you join Discord, I'm going to put all these tips in there. Uh, any other quick questions about software engineering as a career, things like that, before we move on and start getting deeper into the lecture? Thoughts on learning Python? I love Python. I'm, I'm trying to get better at it myself right now. Um, here's the thing. If your goal is to get a job, I highly recommend full stack JavaScript. There are more jobs available. You only have to learn one language. You don't have to context switch between two languages. Uh, and there is slightly more demand uh, for it. Not that much, but slightly more. So if I'm saying like I need a job as quickly as possible, my answer is always going to be uh, full stack JavaScript, meaning JavaScript and maybe something like Node on the back end. Okay. Now, if you say, hey, Leon, I just want to learn computer science. I find this to be fun. My goal is not a job as quickly as possible. Then I'd probably recommend Python. Yeah. Is there a more comprehensive online bootcamp that you can recommend for those who master the basics? First, build something. If you haven't tried building a project on your own, please don't move on to another tutorial. If you've gotten the basics down, you feel comfortable with the basics, build stuff. Through building, you're gonna learn so much more than if you had just kind of somewhat followed along with the tutorial. So my advice is always learn the basics, build a really cool app, that pushes yourself, find a community that's gonna help you get unstuck, work through the challenges. Uh, and then my current advice is to start looking for a job and have somebody pay you to learn the rest. Uh, if, uh, if that doesn't work out, uh, I also recommend open source once you've built one project on your own. I would recommend that all day long above any other course. Now, there are tons of courses that if you want, if you want, like a course, there's tons of them out there. Uh, and I don't necessarily recommend a boot camp right off, right out the jump. Here's when I would recommend a boot camp or a more serious paid course. One, you've already determined you really like this stuff. Like this is it. You want to make a career change. You're ready to invest in yourself and say, "Hey, I, 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 I want to do. I want to do something where I'm going to put money on the line, put some meat on the on the bones, right? And 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 really go after it." Make sure you're at that point. Don't be at the beginning saying, I want to do a boot camp, right? That, that you're going to pay thousands of dollars for. Be already further along in the process where you're like, all right, this is my life. This is what I want to do. How can I get there the fastest, right? Then if you're going to go to a boot camp, be careful. Not all of them are the same. Read the reviews. Look at their students. Look at them on LinkedIn. Can you find their students on LinkedIn? Do they still have jobs? right? Talk to the people that you're going to be in the classroom with, right? Do your due diligence, due diligence to make sure they're a good, they're a good fit. Um, and then realize that a, a boot camp provides kind of like two things. They provide like accountability. You have to be here at this time, at this pace. And for a lot of people that gives them the discipline they need to push through. And the other thing is it's a built in community that helps you get unstuck. For a lot of folks, those two things are really powerful, that built-in discipline and the ability to get unstuck, but you don't need it. You can do it all on your own for free. Uh, and so that's kind of you, it's, it's a really personal question. Uh, a lot of folks have stopped by my office hours. I have 20 folk, I had 20 folks last Monday and 20 folks this past Monday um, that came to my office hours. And that's probably the most common question is like, should I do a boot camp? which one, right? That's a really personal decision. Do you have the discipline to do it on your own and save that money? Or do you need to, do you want that accountability, right? Do you want that built in community? You can find discipline in the community on your own, but if you want it, boot camps are a phenomenal option, 
right? Uh, folks that do my boot camps at General Assembly, I say they get two wonderful things. One, they get to look at me every Tuesday and Thursday because I'm wonderful to look at. I have nice hair. Uh, and they get somebody that's going to say like, hey, why didn't you show up today? <laughs> uh, and for a lot of folks, that's really worthwhile, right? Um, so yeah, think through those things before, before you make the decision for a boot camp. As for online courses, there are so many that are free. Odin Project, free. Like, Follow that along to get to the point where you can build stuff on your own and then build, 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 work on some open source projects uh, and know that my advice for getting a career as quickly as possible is somewhat different. Uh, there, there's, a, I think, a little bit more of a direct path. Like, If you want a job, you should learn the basics, build one cool project, and then your life should be eat, sleeping, and breathing the job search. Uh, I'm going to put out a blog post on how to do the job search right. Uh, but for folks that want a job as quickly as possible, it's really learn the basics, build something cool that you can show off, and then job search like your like it was your job. <laughs> cool. Uh, I'm not a fan of certificates. Uh, some folks are asking about IT or Comp TIA certs. Uh, nope, I'm not a fan. Uh, software developers, software engineers make more. If you're going to put in all that effort to learn and memorize, learn how to code, make more money, slightly better, slightly better, I think, long-term career options and happiness, unless you like that stuff. If you like networking, that's completely different than software engineering, right? Like it's not completely different, but it's different. And it comes down to like passion and personal choice too. Um, explore these careers, really figure out what's going on before kind of committing. Uh, so I say build a project. What would that look like? Uh, so some of the projects my students have built. Uh, I've had some students build uh, VR games. Uh, I've had students build um, social media apps. I've had students build uh, uh, one, of, one of them was a tattoo AR platform. Like you would hold up your arm and put the phone in front of it and it would show you what like tattoos would look like on your arm. Um, there are ton, like anything that you're passionate about, anything that's going to like get you up and you're going to be like, holy crap, I can't wait to build today. That's what I want you to build. Not, I don't want you to build like a to-do list. <laughs> Nobody like wakes up and is like, woo, to-do list time. No. Pick something that you're super passionate about, right? Something that you're really excited every day to wake up and build and build that. Um, one of the best examples I've, I've ever seen of this is uh, one of our, our mentors on the Discord uh, and uh, was a great expert in residence at Resilient Coders, uh, De Jesus. He, uh, Nick, he, he built the premier frame data app for Tekken, the video game. So like how to play Tekken better, right? He's super passionate about Tekken and was super passionate about learning how to code. And he sunk hours into that project. But guess what? He's a damn good coder now because of it. What are you going to be passionate about to wake up every day in code? And then when you get stuck, find people that are going to help you get unstuck. Uh, I don't recommend. So the question is, would you recommend having a great list of apps on GitHub before you're starting the job search process? No, you need one. You need one killer app. That's it. And then start job hunting. If you know the basics, once you know the basics, start building your app, start doing code challenges on code wars or elite code and start your job search as soon as possible. But we'll, we'll get into that when we get to the end of the course, like the last class, we'll talk all about like how to do the job search, how to continue on. Um, but yeah. All right. So what is your outlook on learning to code for games? Um, gaming is the allure and draw for most people. When I talk to most people that want to get into tech, they're like, Leon, I want to build games. Great. Build games. If that's going to get you excited to wake up every day, uh, we have we had a, we have a chair at our office, at re, in my resilient coders office, uh, and I'm I'm going to get a plank like a plaque for it that says Alan. Uh, Alan was one of my students that built a full blown RPG in Unity, uh, but the man didn't leave that chair. He was in that chair 14 hours a day. Like I I I would walk into the classroom and he'd already be in that chair. I'd leave the classroom and he'd be in that chair. Building games is hard. It takes a long time. But if you're passionate about it, sure. The only downside about the games industry is that everyone wants to kind of be in it. So it's kind of, and this is not firsthand knowledge. It's kind of what I've heard is that um, 
they're, they don't treat their employees all that too well. Uh, and it's super competitive. So salaries might be slightly less, but that's kind of anecdotal. I, I don't know, honestly, hundred percent for sure. So yes, if code, if, if building games is going to be what gets you into learning how to code, do it. Absolutely do it. Um, but know that the industry job opportunity is a little bit different. What is the chance of someone getting a job as a web developer, software engineer that does not have a degree or job experience in technology? Uh, 85% <laughs> because that's what I see at resilient coders. Uh, I have, I have all that data, right? I have that data. So that's the data I'm going to use. 85% of our graduates go on to get a job full time as a software engineer after a 20 week boot camp. So I'm going to say the exact chance is 85%. Uh, and I think you can bump it up by taking the job search really, 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 really kind of intense. So most of the folks that graduate from resilient coders don't have degrees. And it's also kind of their first time jumping into code. And in 20 weeks, they go from kind of having no um, coding ability to having enough to land a full-time role as a software engineer. So yes, you can get a job. You don't need a degree. Um, and you can learn this stuff. So yeah. All right. All right, folks. I think we're warmed up. I think we're ready to go. I would love to kind of... Um, jump into uh, the lecture today and we're going to go through I, I want to put some breaks in as well uh, just so folks can grab some water can stretch uh, being at your computer for hours after a long day I know is difficult so uh, let's kind of start off a little bit and then uh, we will kind of take some breaks along the way so if you're kind of getting itchy for a break don't worry breaks are going to come soon also, you can do exclamation part slides and you'll see the slides um, pop up. Cool. Let's keep going. Uh, here's your motivation. Don't let your dreams be dreams. If you want to make it into tech, just don't stop. That's the only thing that stops people is stopping. So don't let your dreams be dreams. You can do this. Uh, I've seen folks from every walk, shape of life that said, you know what? I want this. I want to be a software engineer. Buckled down and did it. I had folks that were incarcerated and hadn't touched a computer in, in five plus years. I had folks that said they were bad at math. I, I, I had folks that when they, when they put their mind to it, they wouldn't put in the hard work. You can do it. You can push through, you can do it for free. You don't need a degree. Uh, so don't let your dreams be dreams. All right. You all signed up or are watching something that says free web development bootcamp. Free web development boot camp. So hopefully you're here and you haven't been bamboozled. Hopefully nobody's like holding you here against your will uh, to learn about web development. So my favorite first question is what is the web? What's the web? I'm going to sit back. I want to see, I want to see some answers come in and I will literally take anything. If you say Leon cheeseburger, I'll be like, yep, that's the web, right? What's the web? Put it in Twitch chat, please. Put it in our Discord chat. What's the web? And yes, these these will all be recorded, so you can follow up. Yep, they'll be uploaded to, to YouTube. Uh, I'm going to upload all of these to YouTube. I'm probably going to edit them. This is live, folks. I might say things that are wrong or incorrect. YouTube will be my chance to kind of correct them um, that way uh, if uh, there is some small changes that need to be happened, but all of them will wind up on YouTube. A connection to the world. I love it. Yes, that's the web. A series of pipes. Boom, that's the web. Web, not the web, the web. How networks are connected. Correct. Web is a highway. Yes. A bunch of servers. Yes. The matrix. Yes. Connection computers, databases, information communication. Yes. Yes, you are all on fire. Keep it going. Millions of pages connected through the network. Yes. Cats. It is tons of cats. The friends we make it along the way. Yes, that's it. Uh, strip club, yes. Cat videos, yes. Network computers, yes. Leon, yes. Ant Farm, yes. Hufflepuff, yes. Uh, so you're all all right. That er all that is the web. Uh, when we start talking about the web, we start talking about the internet. And so to start talking about the internet, it, I want to start with just a very simple line. Okay? I'm going to start with a very simple line here. So I'm going to go ahead and click the draw button here, hopefully, and I'm just going to draw a line. 
That's the start of the internet. Okay, a cable. If I was to connect all the folks that are here on Twitch chat together with just a cable, right? And it was kind of closed off to anyone else. It was just for us. We had some security put in place. We'd have what's called an intranet. We could share our cat photos with just each other. As soon as we take that kind of connection of computers and connect it to other computers and open it up so other folks can join, boom, we have an internet. And the internet really kind of connects two major devices. And remember, this is this is a high level overview. A lot of this, the, lot, you could spend your whole career on just one segment of this. And so this is meant to be a high level interview overview. Uh, it's not gonna be 100% like factually correct. It's meant to give us an idea of how the internet actually works, right? So it really connects two kinds of devices. We have client side devices, and I apologize for my handwriting, and servers. All right. Client side devices are the devices that we use to access the internet. It is our mobile phones, it is our laptops, it is our desktops, it's anything that we use to connect to the internet. You might have a refrigerator or a coffee machine that's a client-side device and connects to the internet. Those client-side devices, we use them to make requests to other computers. So from my client-side device, say my phone, like I'm going to dominoes.com, Let's say I type in dominoes.com on my client side device. That request is going to leave my client side device, right? And find its way to another computer. And that computer is gonna have everything I need so that I can render the Domino's website back on that device, all right? So typically on our client side device, all right? We're going to have a program running and that program is going to be a browser. That browser is the program that enables us to read the HTML, CSS and JavaScript files that we talked about earlier. Okay. Let's step back from this for a second. If I asked you, what's the program to open a word document? What would you say? Put it in chat, please. The program to open a Word document. Looking for 300 IQ answers here. Yes, it is Word. You would use Word to open a Word document, right? We would say the program running on our device that can open a Word document is Microsoft Word. Okay? Here's a bit trickier one. What's the program that you would use to open a PDF? Open Office. What's the program you would use to open a PDF? Adobe, maybe. Yep. Yeah, I think a lot of people are saying Adobe. Yeah, you would use some sort of PDF reader like Adobe to open that PDF. Well, the browser is the same thing. The browser is going to open specific files. The files that the browser is going to be really good at opening and reading are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So when I type in dominoes.com into my browser on my client side device like my phone, what I am saying is, hey, make a request across the internet to a computer that has those files. And that computer is gonna respond with that HTML, it's gonna respond with that CSS, it's gonna respond with that JavaScript, and we're going to be able to see those delicious pizzas on dominoes.com, right? That's what's happening on the internet. You're making a request and receiving responses, okay? Now, there's lots of steps in between. There's lots of little things that kind of get in our way of that, that request and response happening. So we're going to talk about a few of those things. But it's really important to understand that a client-side device is just some sort of computer. A server is just some sort of computer as well. Instead of it kind of rendering via the browser, the server probably has those files on it, right? Has those files and it wants to respond to you as well, okay? 
So let's go ahead and say we're going to type a request into our client side device in our browser. Let's say we're going to go to, uh, I don't know, what do all the cool kids do these days? Facebook. I don't, I don't go on Facebook. Facebook.com. You see some Facebook account that says Leon, learn with Leon and friends. It's not me. It's a scam. All right. So we're going to go to Facebook. So we type in Facebook.com into the browser on our client side device. That request is going to leave our client side device. Maybe you connect it to Wi-Fi. That request goes to, I gotta figure out where to point. That request goes to our, our router, our modem, and then makes it out onto the internet. That request is gonna try and find its way all the way to Facebook server. And Facebook server is gonna have some HTML, some CSS, some JavaScript that it is then going to send back, right? Some HTML, some CSS, some JavaScript. The sad thing is I went to art classes for years. And I'm from Philly. Every Saturday, there was a free art class run by nuns. My mom was the queen of finding free stuff for me to do. So I went to this art class for years. Uh, and so I apologize to myself, to my mom and all the nuns uh, that my drawing is this bad. Um, we've made a request from our device like our phone, right? That request has made itself all the way to the server. The server hears that request and responds with that HTML, that CSS, that JavaScript. And then what we see is in our browser, we see that response. Right, we see that response in the browser. We see it on our screen. Okay. Now there are some other steps that happen in the process. Um, there's an ISP somewhere along this way. Anybody know what an ISP stands for? Rush, I will take you up on learning how to draw better. I am so down. Now, what's an ISP stand for? Yeah, internet service provider. Internet service provider are the folks that we pay money uh, and they help connect us to the, to the wire, to the internet, right? You pay them the bucks and they help you get on that wire, right? And the funny thing is like the internet really is a wire. Like I'm not joking, it is a wire. Like if we look at this, this is a Google search history here. Uh, here's Google images of the transatlantic internet cables. These are cables that we lay across the ocean, right? To send data back and forth. Uh, until until Elon Musk's Starlink takes over, this is how we do it, right? Here's what they actually look like. Uh, there's these big, massive cables, and inside of them, I've been told that there's like eight fiber wires, and those fiber wires, uh, last time I was reading about it, can transmit up to 53 terabytes per second of data, right? So, I forget this is loud, I can't, I can't, I, Let's say you were someone that illegally downloads movies. I don't do that. Never have, never will. But if you did, you would know a high quality Blu-ray rip is around three gigabytes. So we're talking about like the entire Blu-ray collection going across one of those wires per second. So you can look at your cute cat photos, right? And so the cable's real, like that wire is real. And so, the ISPs, you're giving them some money to help connect you to that wire. But some of those ISPs, like Verizon, somewhat Comcast, they're in charge of what's called last mile, like laying the cable that gets it to your house, all right? Like laying the cable that gets to your house, all right? And it's really expensive, like really expensive. Um, there was an article that was floating around some time ago about Verizon coming to Boston and wanting to lay cable. And they were saying it was like $5 million a block. No idea if that's true, but they were saying around $5 million a block. So as much as I hate Comcast, I don't want a sponsorship Comcast. As much as I hate Comcast, I kind of get it. It's really expensive to lay that cable. So... We pay some money, they help connect us to the cable, all right? Then there's another step, and it doesn't necessarily have to happen in this order, in this order but there's another step called DNS. 
Stands for, anybody know what DNS stands for? Oh, we have somebody that laid last mile for Comcast. Wow, that's awesome. I got some questions for you. Come on, folks, in Discord. What's DNS? Chat, what's DNS? Ooh, doctor needs sunscreen. Love it. <laughs> uh, domain name server. Domain name server. Domain name server is like a fancy, fancy phone book. Let me ask you another question. If I wanted you to show up on my back porch, please don't show up on my back porch. I don't know you. Don't show up at my house. But if I wanted you to show up on my back porch, what information could I give you that would get you to my back porch? An address? An address might get you to my house. You might be like creepily standing outside, like looking through my windows. It won't get you exactly to my front porch, though. My back porch, not my front. So an address won't. Ah, BitQuest Dev. Nice. Latitude and longitude. I could give you the exact latitude and longitude coordinates, the GPS coordinates, right? <laughs> <laughs> Quinn said drop a pin. Uh, I could give you the exact GPS coordinates to my back porch, right? And that would get you there, exactly there. But the problem is we don't want to be talking to our friends and be like, hey, would you meet me at 147.8446321415? Comma 142145762121, right? We don't want to have to memorize all of those GPS coordinates. So we have an address system and the address system is easier to understand. Right. Same thing with the Internet. We have something called an IP address. The IP address is kind of like the direct connection, like where to go to find that server, like the GPS coordinates to find that server. But we don't want to have to memorize all of these IP addresses. Right. So you can think of an IP address like so here's Facebook's IP address. That's not Facebook's IP address. I'm not a wild person. I don't have these memorized, uh, but something like that, right? Let's pretend that's that's something like Facebook's IP address, right? Now, we don't wanna have to say, hey, did you check out what was happening on 133463217467746 recently? That would be too much to remember, but we can remember facebook.com, right? So these URLs are easy to remember but the URL doesn't really tell where the request needs to go to find the server. So we have this DNS, which is like a big, like big directory. It's just a computer as a directory. And it says, all right, whoop, you want facebook.com. Here's the IP address. That's all it is. It just looks it up. Just think of a really big phone book of like the thing you want and the number to find it. All right. All right. We got some nerds in the chat. Yes. <laughs> there, there has, there are different uh, internet protocols. V four, V six, right? Uh, and this number is not a real number. I just made this up. <laughs> this is not Facebook's IP address, uh, but it's something like it. It looks close, right? So, what actually happens when we take when we type in Facebook.com, right? When you type in Facebook.com, that request finds its way to a DNS. And the DNS gives you the IP address. And then with this IP address, we can then go ahead and find the server. And the server is really just another computer that's gonna listen for that request. And it has some code running on it that's listening for those requests. And it's gonna say, all right, Leon just made a request. Let's, let's check our code. Is Leon authenticated? Like, is he logged in? Should we, should we send him anything? All right, checks out. He's logged in, looks good. All right, let's send him, right? Let's send him all the information he cares about. Let's send him some HTML. Let's send him some CSS. Let's send him some JavaScript. And then it kind of goes all the way back across the wire. It goes through all those steps again and eventually finds ourselves back on the client side device. And then the browser, the browser can render that HTML, can render that CSS, and that's how we see a website. Whew, it's a lot, folks. But you know what? I'm gonna knight you all. 
You are all newly knighted developers of the web. You have to go out and do well and do good uh, because you now know more than like 99.99% of people about how the internet works. All right. All of that for a pizza. Exactly. <laughs> Quick questions while we're here. Quick questions while we're here. I want to talk a little bit more about this and then we're going to take a break. What about using rocks as checkpoints? <laughs> so the actual dot com is interesting. It's called a TLD. Uh, there are a couple top level ones that are all managed by a, like a quasi governmental organization called ICANN. Uh, but then each country also gets their own TLD. So there are some newer ones that are circulating like dot IO. That's actually the Indianic Ocean Territories like ending. They get their own. Uh, and then a couple years ago, they opened up a bunch of them, like dot ninja, dot dev, things like that. So there are a bunch of them out there. Yeah, originally I believe it's for commercials, like the original one. We had like dot edu, dot commercial, dot mil for military. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, time to start applying for jobs. I love it. <laughs> Any questions about the internet? Internet. I'll come back and answer some of these other questions when we take a break for sure. Questions about the internet and how it works. Uh, yes, you can think of the DNS like a phone book. It's a really fancy phone book. Cool. Let's just talk a few more things about this and then we're going to take a break. Okay. This whole process runs on top of something called HTTP. Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Right. It dictates how the information is sent back and forth. And HTTP actually sits on something called TCP IP. It's kind of like all the rules for how this stuff goes back and forth. And something fundamentally changed about how this works. And the thing that fundamentally changed was one letter. Anybody know what letter that was? One letter changed the game in all of this. S. It was S. Exactly. S. S in the chat. Boom. HTTPS. Stands for secure. Before we had HTTPS, these requests and responses were viewable by anyone in between. Right? There is this really interesting app that I never used. I never used this app. I, I don't even know people that use this app. I just, I've read about it once. There was this app called Fire Sheep. And it was just a like a Firefox plugin, like not some leet hacker type stuff. It was a plugin that you could hit a button and you would see all the requests that were happening near you. Uh, so some folks would go to like a, they would post up at like a Starbucks or something like that, turn it on and kind of see the data that was going back and forth. Once again, not me, not any of my friends, something I read about, right? Because all of this was kind of just floating by there. It was, it was out there for you to enjoy. Uh, it was not encrypted. It was not secure. HTTPS made sure that the stuff we were sending from the client to the server and back was encrypted. Now, what that means is I can no longer see the things you're passing back and forth, like passwords. Can't see your passwords anymore. I can't see the forms you're filling out anymore. All that's encrypted. There are still a few things that I can see, and I'm actually going to show you some of the stuff that you can see. Here we go. So right now, this is showing you some of the stuff that you can see. Uh, when I make a request, I can see kind of like where you're coming from based on your IP address. Not only do servers have one, but you have one. I can see some stuff about your computer, like what type of computer it is. I can see um, what, like, so here you can see that I'm on a Mac, which I am. You can see that I am running Chrome, which I am. And you can see all the little things that make up, uh, all the little things that make up, right? All the little things that like make up the, the thing, the, the, the person that's making the request, 
right? Now, this this location is not true. This is not my IP address. I want to go on the internet and share my IP address and my location. Uh, I'm behind a VPN, which we'll get to in a second. But this is some of the stuff that's sent along, okay? So things like IP address, where you're coming from, and now still the URL. The URL is still sent along. So anyone that's in this chain, whether it's somebody that's on your modem, whether it's your ISP, whether it's your DNS provider, whether it's any of the routers in between, they can still see the URL even with HTTPS. So that weird website that you don't want anyone to know that you're visiting, they might know, right? And so the ISPs won this like very interesting court case recently where not only are they able to like record all of this, they're allowed to resell it if they want. And so this is where the idea of, wait a minute, how can I like protect myself so that URL isn't seen and my IP address is revealed? Some people like to use an incognito browser. That doesn't stop your IP address or the URL from being shared. It, only thing it does is stops the things you type in from showing up on your computer again if somebody like jumps on and uh, uses your computer. So like, if I was gonna go to that website that I shouldn't be going to, I would open up incognito, not because it protects me, it's just so that when I'm teaching live and I do this, you ready folks? When I do that, privacy tools pop up, nothing else, okay? That's what incognito browser protects you from. It makes sure that nothing stays in that, that history right there, okay? But, but that's all it does. Your IP address is still revealed. Your, the URL you're searching for is still revealed. And so some folks elect to use a VPN. A VPN stands for a virtual private network. It's basically another computer. It's another computer that you then send all your requests through and then those requests go to the server. So you can think of it like a, as a person in the middle, right? Like a, a person in the middle, right? And what that does is it makes sure that the URL you're going to and your IP address aren't revealed. Now, people love the Oprah hype VPNs. There's really only a few times that you wanna use them. One, if you rather have the VPN provider have that URL instead of your ISP and if you're torrenting. That's really only a VPN is really useful for. Like if you like, it might help with some other privacy tracking stuff. But the big thing is I don't want my ISP to see that I'm downloading the stuff that I shouldn't be downloading in the first place, which again, I do not download things, nor have I downloaded things in the past. This is for educational purposes, right? But if I was to, then I would use a VPN. And if I knew that I constantly would go to that one website I didn't want anybody to know about, I might use a VPN because some VPNs claim to not keep logs, meaning that they are not recording the URL that you're going to, but you kind of have to trust them. So do you trust your ISP? Fuck Comcast, so hell no, I don't trust my ISP. So then I'm stuck with trusting a VPN provider. So that's what I do. Uh, there are tons of VPNs out there I'm always gonna say, if you're at the point where you feel like you need to use a VPN, you should do the research to find the VPN. I really like privacytools.io. They walk through all the reasons why you might wanna use a VPN and recommend some really good ones. Uh, I typically don't like to share the VPN I use for operational security reasons, um, but privacytools.io has a good list. Tor, Tor is also an interesting thing. Uh, Tor is a completely different protocol. So instead of using this lovely HTTPS that we're using, uh, it uses the Onion network. And what it does is think of like a, and this is might be like a really bad example of this. Imagine like an onion and like in the middle is the place you want it to go to. And so you take the onion and you pass it to the next person. They peel off the layer. They pass on to the next person. They peel off the layer. And eventually after a bunch of passes, it gets to where it needs to go. Right, that's Tor. People use it for accessing the dark web, ooh, right? That's what people use Tor for, um, or just because they have to, right? Tor can be used for folks um, 
that need the protections of their IP address not being revealed. And so Tor is like a beautiful thing to have. Everyone should should at least try it out so that the folks that really do need to use it aren't the only people using it. Um, but there was a recent article I saw in Hacker News that said most of the exit nodes are compromised. So using that as your sole source of security online might not be the best thing right now. It's a lot, folks. So high level overview. We have client side devices, things like our mobile phones, our laptops that make requests. Those requests find themselves across the internet to another computer called a server. And that server responds with things like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So over the next couple of weeks together, we're gonna learn how to build the HTML, the content, the things that we see the CSS for styling that content and the JavaScript for that behavior and interaction that we apply to it. Okay. So that's kind of what we're doing here. All right. Quick questions. And then I would love to take a quick break. Quick questions. And we're going to take a break. Learning a lot. You're flexing those brain muscles. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, I hope you're getting something out of this. Uh, remember, you can do exclamation point discord to join our discord uh, and exclamation point uh, slides if you want to follow along with the slides. Before HTTPS, where in your drawing was the plugin able to view the info? Like what part did that add the security to? What do you mean by plugin? Oh, oh, sorry. The the plugin, uh, the Fire Sheep, that was just a Firefox extension, uh, and that would just it would just snoop any of the traffic that was on a um, on the network that you were connected to. The best hacking book class. Uh, so the funny thing is, I can see the picture. It's called the Web Hackers Handbook, version two. It's like a blue book with white lettering on the front. I believe it's the Web 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 Hackers Handbook. That's my favorite one. Uh, it's just like practical. It was fun. I recommend it to my, there, I have a lot of younger students. Um, I, I teach uh, vicious seventh graders how to code uh, before the pandemic hit. Uh, yeah, the seventh graders are vicious. The sixth graders are just stinky, uh, but they all want to hack. And so that's the book I recommend to them that want to learn how to hack. Uh, can I explain the URL real quick? Absolutely. So to get the request from the client side device, right, to the server, we need the IP address. But IP addresses are really hard to remember. It's just a lot of random numbers. So what we do is we create URLs like facebook.com and that request finds its way to a DNS and that DNS gives us the IP address so that we can then make it to the server. So it's just like a fancy like phone book. You type it like you like you you say like what's what's the the number for the pizza place, and then it gives you the number for the pizza place. Domain name system is what DNS stands for. What's the recommended operating system to code with? Whatever one you have access to. Uh, I code on Mac OS and GNU Linux. Uh, I also have a Windows PC as well. Cool. All right. It is 748 Eastern time. I'm going to give everyone just like, let's just take like quick two minutes, quick two minutes to go grab some water, to grab some, to stand up, stretch real quick. If you're watching this, please stand up and stretch. Just, just get up real quick. Stretch your hand, stretch to the sky a little bit, grab some water. Uh, take two minutes, two minutes. Uh, I'm just going to chill and answer questions for two minutes. And then we're going to jump right back to the slides. Cool. So take two minutes. <laughs> Somebody has to feed up. Oh, there you go. The Nova Stella has to feed her cat, their cats. Uh, Spliff Gates asks, how do I record notes into Anki as I learn new stuff? I'm a big fan of typing everything manually into Anki. The trick to Anki that I learned way too late was I only put questions into Anki. Everything should be phrased as a, as a question because that helps with the act of recall. Uh, whenever I take notes, I don't actually write notes. I only write questions. Um, 
I think once I, I don't, I don't want to pull it up right now because I don't have it set up, but next class I will send you, I'll show you my Anki setup and I'll show you my notes taking system. Uh, I only take questions. I only write down questions and they put it in Anki. Uh, I am hydrating. I am sipping on water right now. Yeah. Talking a lot. You need some water in you. I am a big fan of scotch though. Uh, big scotch drinker. Right now, I'm kind of into the Japanese type scotches. I have a nice bottle of Hibiki Harmony that I'm working through. I'm just giving folks like another minute or so just to grab water, stretch. How do you recommend getting into coding with the Raspberry Pi? Uh, there are some real, the, the, there's like a really good Raspberry Pi tutorial. Um, that's uh, if you if you're going to hit me up, ping me on Discord, and I'll send you the Raspberry Pi tutorial. Uh, I have a, a post on my blog, uh, leonnoel.com, uh, where I built uh, a whole computer lab for folks uh, in uh, Kenya and Tanzania um, that were way, way, way remote, um, all built on Raspberry Pis with tons of coding software and everything baked in. Yeah, Rush, they are actually working on Skynet <laughs> a little bit. Uh, Elon Musk has Starlink coming out soon, which I guess is like the start of it, uh, which are low Earth, low, low Earth orbit satellites. Uh, the problem with satellite internet for the longest time was the connection between like your computer going all the way up into the sky and then coming all the way back down to a server. That latency was really long. But what Elon Musk is going to do is put the satellites lower in our orbit. So the um, the trip from uh, the ground to the satellite and down is way, way, way shorter. And therefore, the latency isn't that bad. He's promising that you'll be able to play video games on Starlink with minimal minimal lag. Like for all like if you're on our Discord, I see you all playing Counter Strike. I'm a big Counter Strike player. I will be playing Counter Strike with y'all soon. Um, but you wouldn't be able to play Counter Strike on satellite internet now. The latency is too much. But with Starlink, hopefully it won't be. Uh, my blog is just Leon L E O N Noel N O E L dot com. Ah, yes. Three ups asked, how could you create a web application that would primarily be used in low bandwidth areas? Just write HTML. That's it. Don't write any CSS. Don't write any, um, don't write any JavaScript, just beautiful HTML is all you need. Uh, and that's how you could really handle low bandwidth areas. There was, there was a report that came out like 2016, 2017, that said AOL still had like 2 million dial-up subscribers. I, it, it, was, it wasn't like that long ago, right? It was, it, was, it was pretty recent where they still had like like millions of dial-up subscribers. So if you have high-speed internet access, that is a huge luxury. Um, but there are a lot of folks that don't. Uh, so much so that a lot of, a lot of bigger uh, companies like CNN and stuff like that, they're doing this. Light.cnn.com. Here's light version of CNN. This is just um, links. It's just HTML and a little bit of CSS. So no one of those big images that take a while to download, stuff like that. Uh, I play CSGO and I play Source still a lot. I really like um, like jailbreak and surfing on Source more. Cool. All right, I think that's enough. Everybody had a nice little break, grab some water. All right, let's continue on with the lecture and we're gonna get to some live coding here. Let's buckle up, let's get into it. All right, comfy. All right, so we talked about the internet and what it is. You're now newly de uh, knighted developers of the web that are gonna go out there and do good, keep people secure, tell them that incognito browsers do nothing, that they might need a VPN if they're torrenting, et cetera, et cetera. All right, who's heard of HTML5? Have you heard of HTML5? Um, just put a, an emo your favorite emoji in the chat for me, please. If you've heard of HTML5. Okay. Okay. Heard of HTML5? Okay. 
So HTML, HTML5 is technically the fifth version of HTML. I say that technically because they kind of skipped some stuff, but it's the fifth version of HTML. And what do I mean by version? HTML uh, was created by now knighted Sir Tim Berners-Lee. That's him getting knighted. Could you believe this man was knighted? And this is the best photo I can find on Google images of this man getting knighted. How do you get knighted and not have a dope like photo of yourself? Like it should be the first Google result. Um, so Sir Tim Berners-Lee uh, was working on hypertext, the very, very beginnings of HTML. Uh, and what happened as the internet became more of a commercial thing for normal folks that weren't at universities or working for the government was that we started what were called the browser wars. Anybody know what the first like mainstream web browser was? Let's see if anybody can write that in chat. That's a difficult one. The first mainstream browser was Mosaic. And Mosaic got a lot of really quick early traction. And then Netscape happened. And then IE happened. And we had what were called the browser wars, where individuals would write HTML, eventually some JavaScript, and it literally would not work in a different browser. It just wouldn't work in another browser. Like the hard work you put in just didn't work in another browser. And so the internet was on its way to being very fragmented. All these companies wanted to own the internet and they figured if we make the best browser with the best features, everyone will use ours instead of, so, of the competitors. And so it was broken. Certain Berners-Lee, he had this idea of putting together the W3C or the World Wide Web Consortium. It was a group of individuals from those browser companies, folks that were involved in computer science that said, hey, here are some recommendations on kind of solidifying what HTML should be. And everyone kind of ignored them. <laughs> uh, they were there, but people didn't play along. And through a series of really important events, really internal advocates at these big companies, the W3C started to put out like official, not real more recommendations, but like guidelines. And slowly but surely through the work of very hard, like hard work of very diligent people, we started to kind of coalesce around a standard for HTML, a standard for CSS, and even a standard for JavaScript, which we'll get to later. And so we're kind of like in the fifth version of that standard. So you might have heard of HTML5 because it brought a lot of really good stuff to the browser. A lot of stuff that really broke the internet of yore is now like fixed because of HTML5. So if you've ever like used video in the browser without needing a plugin like Flash or Silverlight or for my OG's real media player, uh, you can thank HTML5 for that. Um, if you've ever listened to SoundCloud or any of the other audio platforms in the browser, right, without needing some sort of audio plugin, then boom, you are utilizing HTML5 audio. If you've ever played any of the IO games, like Agger.io, Slither.io, um, when I was teaching web development to my sixth graders, they completely ignored me until we started building a clone of Slither.io. Uh, these games that are real time in the browser without any downloading or installing, that's lovely Canvas. If you've ever been to a website and it allowed your location, right? You didn't have to, I didn't have to like sniff your IP address or do something weird. You just like said, boop, allow, and I had your location. Then we were good. Uh, that's HTML5 geolocation. If you've ever spent a late night talking about politics on chat roulette or a Megal, that's also a feature that came native with HTML5, okay? Without HTML5, we wouldn't have a lot of these experiences baked into the browser. I saw some people get a little scared when I mentioned Omegle. All right, so here it is. Here's the most important thing we're gonna talk about tonight. 
If you leave with nothing else, please leave with this. The golden rule, a.k.a. separation of concerns. When you're first starting out, one of the most important things to stick to is this rule. You should only put content in your HTML. You should only put style in your CSS and your behavior and interaction should only be in JavaScript. Okay. You shouldn't mix them or combine them. There should be no CSS in your HTML. There should be no HTML in your CSS. There should be no JavaScript wiggled in between. Why do we think that this separation of concerns is so important? Anybody want to throw out some ideas there in chat? Yeah, right out the gate. Uh, it really does help with organization, right? Let's say we're working as a team. Let's say there's 180 of us here right now. We're going to work as a developer. And I say, you know what? I really love this, but it needs to be more pink. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go look? Where are you going to look? I said it needs to be more pink. Where are you going to go? Put your answer in chat. Boom. You're going to go to CSS. If you say, you know what? I love this, but it needs, I want, I want a, another paragraph. I want more text. Where are you going to go? Put it in chat. I want another paragraph, more text. Yeah. HTML. And if I say when I, when it, when the user clicks, I want it to spin around. Where are you going to go? Put it in chat, please. Boom, JavaScript, right? And so right off the gate, we've only been doing this for an hour and a half and you're already engineers ready to work on a team, right? Because when somebody says fix content, you know, you go to HTML. When somebody says to fix style, you know, you go to CSS. And when somebody says, hey, fix the behavior interaction, you know to go to JavaScript, right? And so this is really important. It gives you the ability to work well with teams, to stay organized for yourself and future folks. Uh, and the cool thing is it really does make so that you can write code that you know how to fix a month from now, a year from now, you know where to go, you know, you're organized. Cool. Um, <laughs> Fang, here I come. <laughs> so keep this rule. It's the most sacred of the rules that we have. Any questions about separation of concerns? There is some caveats. There's two caveats. Uh, the first caveat is sometimes you're not able to load an external style sheet. That's mainly in like emails. Emails have a difficult time loading anything else. So a lot of times people that write emails, emails are written in HTML. A lot of times when people are writing emails, they'll style them with inline CSS. So you'll see the HTML and then you'll see a little bit of CSS in the same line. Right. That's the first caveat. The second caveat is that Amazon did something called critical path CSS, which is basically putting a little bit of CSS at the top of your HTML just so the first page renders as fast as possible. They had an article a while back that was like something, something really wild. It was like for every one second longer the page takes to load, they lose a million dollars a day, right? So there's like a real clear tie between speed, right? Speed and the the need for like them to make money. So they found out if they cheated the rules that they broke this golden rule just a little bit to put a little snippet, a little snippet of CSS at the top of their head, uh, at the top of their HTML, their, fr their first page could, could load faster. So the two caveats are if you're writing emails or you're working for Amazon, that's it. If you're not working on those two, then stick to this rule. This is it. Stick to it. Cool. Yeah. So there are some things that are going to, to break this rule. 
As long as you understand why and how they're breaking the rule, that's okay. This is a little bit less of a nuanced term. Like what people really advocate is separating like presentation logic out. But don't worry about that. We're not there yet. Just worry about stick to this for right now. And then later on, we'll talk about separating presentation logic. That gives us some flexibility when we get to things like React and even like Bootstrap later on. Yeah, cool. All right, let's keep going. So we're going to learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are all languages. And by languages, we mean that they have spelling and grammar rules, things that like make up the language, just like Spanish has like enyes and, and, and tildes and things like that part of the language. HTML has the same thing, All right? HTML and CSS are technically markup languages, not really programming languages, meaning if I gave them an operation, they're not really gonna respond. Whereas with JavaScript, if I give it an operation like five plus five, it's gonna give me 10 all day long. Uh, but they're all languages. They all have spelling and grammar rules. And when we're talking about languages, whether they be markup or programming languages, uh, we call that spelling and grammar rules syntax. So here is the syntax of HTML. We have an opening tag and a closing tag, and those tags are wrapping around content. Whenever you are writing HTML, whenever you're writing HTML, there should never be any loose content. Every bit of content must be wrapped in the appropriate HTML tag. And there are a lot of them, a couple dozen different tags, okay? And these different tags all have what we call a semantic purpose. Like the reason why you would use one tag over another. There's gonna be a reason, a decision that's made behind each tag. So what we're going to do today, right? What, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna learn about the basic tags, right? We're gonna learn about the basic tags and put them into practice. Oh no, it's dropping. Hmm. All right. Um, how about we do this? Let's, I'm not sure if that's on my end because it's getting a little hot in here. So maybe my, my laptops. So I just got a new PC, right? It's got a new PC. Uh, by Thursday, I'll have that PC up and running. So for that stream, we shouldn't have any lag. What I think is happening is I think my laptop is overheating. Um, so let's go ahead and take a quick break. Let's stop here. Let me see if I can change some settings to make sure it doesn't lag as much. Uh, and let's take a break. So it is 5.07. Let's take a three minute break. Let's take a three minute break uh, and we'll get back started at 5.10. Uh, during those for those few minutes, I'm just going to check on the settings and make sure there's nothing, nothing I can change. Okay. Uh, if audio is good, we'll, we'll continue with the audio and maybe deal with a little bit of lag until Thursday. Um, but let's go ahead and take a three minute break. I'm going to put up the BRB screen and see if I can fix anything.
All right. Can you hear my air condition in the background? <laughs> All right, I think that's what we're gonna have to do for today. I think for today, we're going to keep the, is it really bad, like you can really hear it? Okay, so we're, we're gonna continue with the air con on. I'm hoping that the, um, the air will help cool down my computer. <laughs> uh, and then what we're going to do is we're, we're almost close. We're almost through what I, I want to get through today. Okay. Uh, so it is, it's going to lag a little bit. Uh, we're going to push through just a little bit. I'm going to try and go through. Um, I'm going to try and go through and get through it. And then we're gonna stop. So we'll stop a little bit earlier than we normally would, uh, just before my computer starts to, to kill over. I promise by Thursday, I'll have it all going on an external computer that hopefully won't over uh, overheat, okay? So I'll figure out the settings and I'll figure out how to get on another PC and we'll have it going. Cool. Let's jump back into it. All right, so we were talking about HTML, and we were talking about how HTML has some syntax, like the way that we write things. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at working through some code and talking about the tags that I would use. So what I am going to do is I am going to open up the HTML file that I shared. If you want the actual HTML file in our Discord channel, uh, there is a follow along materials channel. And in that Discord channel will be the materials for the class. So you can go in and download them if you want. So I'm just gonna go ahead and open up that HTML file. I'm just using a text editor. I'm using Atom here, but you could really use any text editor that you want. So here is just an about page about Learn with Leon and Friends. It's about kind of what we're learning here today uh, and about the class. So when I look at this, I have some text here. And Learn with Leon and Friends is the most important thing here. It's the most important content for me, right? And so what I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and wrap that content in an H1 tag. So I'm gonna go at H1 open and then my H1 is going to close, okay? The H1 opens, whoop. All right, did I, is everybody still with me? Can you still hear me? I got a, a drop frame warning, so just making sure you're all with me. All right, still with me. Uh, like I said, we'll, we'll get this fixed up by next stream. Uh, it's just, I think my computer's overheating a little bit. Cool. All right, so what we're gonna do is we have this H1, right? Uh, let me make this bigger so we can see it. H1 stands for the most important content uh, on the page, right? It stands for the most important content on the page. Uh, I'm just making sure that all the settings are going. Hold on one second. Uh, I'm trying to fix the setting here. Sorry, we're having so much trouble with this right now. Cool. All right, here we go. So the most important thing on the page is going to be the H1. And the H1 uh, has an opening tag and a closing tag, just like every other tag in HTML. Okay. You don't have to code along right here. I'm gonna release all the solutions on that follow along as well. Uh, but this is Adam. 
Uh, what I did is I dragged the HTML file to Atom and it opened. You can also do file, open, and open that file. Okay. Uh, next class, we'll spend some time like working through the text editor and how to manipulate files and stuff like that. Uh, so feel free to kind of just follow along for now and don't feel like you have to type along. So most important content goes in our H1. Then I have a big block of text. Whenever I see a big block of text, anybody know what tag we're going to use for a big block of text? Throw it in chat if you know. Big block of text. Yeah, a paragraph. If you were reading a newspaper or a book and you came across a big block of text, you would say that's a paragraph, right? You say that paragraph, right? That paragraph uh, is the block of text, right? So a lot of the HTML actually is just similar to the things that you're already kind of familiar with when you're reading text. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this big block of text. We're gonna open it with a P tag. All right, we're going to open it with a P tag. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come to the end. And whenever we open a tag, we must close it. All right. Whoop, whoop. Sorry. Hold on. And we must close it. There we go. So we open the tag. We close the tag. Get super comfortable with opening and closing your tags. All right. Uh, because if you forget the close one, you're going to see some, some mistakes there. All right. Next, we have a list of different places where folks are joining us from for the bootcamp. Whenever you see a list of places, we're probably going to deal with a list. Uh, we have two kinds of lists in HTML. We have an ordered list and an unordered list. In this case, I'm going to use an unordered list. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to open my UL. So UL, and what I'm going to do is I am going to immediately close it, and I'm going to go ahead and take this UL, and I am going to bring it all the way at the bottom. Let's see if I can, I'm like trying to get out the way of the code. I'm going to bring it all the way to the bottom, and I am going to close it. So let me move this up so we can see it above my head. Here we go. I have the UL that opens. And I have the UL that closes. So opens and closes. All right. But this is a list, an unordered list. If you had something like a grocery list, what goes on your list? What goes on a list, like a grocery list? Eggs. <laughs> yes, eggs do go on the list numbers groceries yeah if you have a grocery list you have items like grocery items that go in that list right <laughs> i love that everyone's like yeah I, I got tomatoes last time i was there some avocados it was good it was a good trip to the to the grocery store yeah items go on your list and so the ul is no different we have all these different locations and all of them need to be inside of a list item so I'm going to go ahead and use some dev magic here. And what I am doing is since I'm using a text editor, I can hold down command or control. And wherever I click, I get this lovely REPL. And then the cool thing is I can start typing, right? I can start typing and I get it typing in all those locations for me. So the cool thing next class that we'll do is we'll spend some time working through these like shortcuts together so that you can actually code a little bit faster. But for this, I just wanna show you uh, the HTML. So I had a list, it opened and closed, and then each of these are elements, right? And so the interesting here is I chose an unordered list. There's also an ordered list. And it's often difficult for new students to figure out when they should use an unordered or ordered. The, we, the time I use an ordered list is when I would get in trouble if things weren't ordered. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if, let's say I was making a recipe, maybe like I was making some brownies and I just poured the water onto the pan, I threw the mix on top, threw some oil on top and put it in the oven. 
I'm not going to walk away with delicious brownies. Right. And so to get delicious brownies, I would have to follow specific steps. That's when I would use an ordered list, something that really has to be in, in a specific order. Right. That's when we're dealing with an order list. Now, these might be. And it's like an alphabetical order, but to me, that's not enough. Something I would get in trouble for. Yeah, I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry it's lagging a little bit here. Um, let's power through it. We're going to end the stream a little bit short. Uh, I hope that you, you got some, some learning in before it started to lag. Uh, let's just power through this last little bit, and then we'll cut it a little bit short, and then it'll give me some time from Thursday, and we'll pick it up on Thursday. Uh, I am going to finish this out here. So we have one more thing here. We have a paragraph down here, like another block of text. And so I am going to wrap this in a P tag just because it's another block of text. And whenever I open a tag, I must close the tag. So I'm just going to jump on down here and I'm going to close it. All right. And so let me scroll this up so that you can see it closing down here. There we go. We had another paragraph. Now, the important thing here is that every bit of content is now, right? Every bit of content is now in a tag, like it's wrapped in a tag. Because when you're writing HTML, the most important thing is that every bit of content is wrapped in a tag, okay? I think maybe if you turn down the um, settings, like if you go from like 1080p, whatever, down to like 720, that might help it a little bit as well. If you're using a text editor, it should auto detect the, the, the tags, right? So if you're using Atom and you've saved it as an HTML file, it'll auto detect the LIs, the ULs, the paragraphs, things like that. Okay. All right. So. We have every bit of content wrapped in a tag. Uh, there's one other thing that I've noticed here too. It says, if you would like real time answers to your questions, please join our Discord here. Right? Please join our Discord here. What does that sound like? Please join here. What does that sound like? Please join here. Yeah, an anchor tag, an href, a link. Like we want somebody to go somewhere, right? A clickable link. So clickable links in HTML are what we call an A tag or an anchor tag. So here's my A tag, it opens. Whenever I open a tag, I always immediately close it. But a link needs something, right? It, it needs where to go. Like where am I gonna go with this tag? So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is do href and href equals and we're going to put in a link here so the link is https leon noel.com slash discord now whenever someone clicks this link it'll take them to discord this is called an attribute value pair the href right here is the attribute and this link is the value okay some opening tags have these superpowers, these attribute value pairs, right? That enable you to like do extra stuff with that opening tag. So here we have our about page. All the content is wrapped in a tag. I'm using Atom and I have installed a plugin called Open in Browser. This plugin enables me to right click and then open this in the browser so I can see my results. And the results look good, right? The interesting thing here though, is look at this H1. This H1 is big, bold, black, and beautiful, much like myself, but there's something interesting about this H1. What's interesting about this H1? What's interesting? It's big, it's bold, it's black, it's beautiful. It's capitalized, it's bolded, it's bigger, it's styled. Wait a minute, 
if it's bigger, it's bolded, it's styled, what does that sound a lot like? What does that sound a lot like? It's bigger. It's bolder. Yeah, it sounds like CSS. That's style. Wait a minute. Did I write any CSS? No, I didn't. I just wrote HTML. So here are the browser wars alive and well, right? Chrome is taking it on itself to make the H1 big and bold. Even though I haven't written any CSS, this is a problem. It's one of the first things when we get to CSS next week, CSS next week that we have to worry about. We have to worry about the idea that the browsers might try to input their own style and how do we combat that? But the important thing right now is the browser is going to kind of do its own thing. The browser is going to go ahead, right? The browser is going to go ahead and impart its own style. So until we write our own CSS, you should not care what it looks like in the browser. This is probably one of the hardest things for folks to kind of wrap their minds around when they're first starting HTML and CSS. Okay. When you're first starting HTML, it does not matter what it looks like. You can't choose tags based on how they look. Some of you said uh, that should be an H1 or the most important thing because it's the biggest, right? We, we want to stay away from choosing tags based on whether or not they should be bigger or smaller or styled a certain way. We want to choose tags based on their semantic meaning, like the reason why we would choose that tag. So what I'm going to do is we're going to walk through some of the, like the key tags. I'm going to introduce a lab and then we're going to stop for the night. Uh, that way my computer won't die uh, and we'll pick back up on, on, on Thursday. We've been doing this for two hours, so I feel pretty good. Uh, but the, the interesting thing here is that we haven't written any CSS. There's some default styling coming through. Please fight the urge when trying to write HTML to care how it looks. Yes, any CSS that we do write will override these browser styles. Okay, so let's go ahead. Let's take a look back at the slides and start looking at some elements. All right, we just coded the about page. Let's look at some elements. Like I said, if you join the discord uh, in the follow along materials, I'll post the solutions when we're done. So if you want the solution to the thing I just coded and the solution to the lab, go ahead and join the Discord. All right, time for some tags. And uh, not these tags. This is extreme world tag. I don't know if you've seen this before. It's like legit organized tag and it's amazing. It's like parkour and tag mixed. Um, all right. Let's get through these tags. It's going to take us maybe 10 minutes to get through these, and then we're, then we're going to stop before my computer explodes. All right. So we have some heading elements, OK? We have H1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, and 6s, all right? When you choose a heading element, you're saying this bit of text describes the text that comes after, right? So think of a newspaper. A newspaper would have a heading, and then Underneath that heading would be some text. So whenever you're trying to describe a bunch of stuff that comes after, a bunch of content that comes after, you use an H1, okay? You shouldn't use an H1 because it makes things big. That's not semantically correct. That's style, that should be controlled by CSS. You should choose an H1 because it's the most important thing on the page. If an H1 is the most important thing, how many H1 should we have? Yeah, we really should only have one H1. Caveat with HTML5, each section can now have its own H1. But when we're thinking in terms of semantics, there really should only be one H1, the most important content, content on the page. Okay, You can really have as many twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes as you want. Uh, and if you're throwing what we call accessibility to the window, uh, you can kind of jump around. Um, headings are really important though when it comes to accessibility. 
somebody that might be experiencing the browser or the web in a way that might be using some sort of aid, like a screen reader, really relies on these heading elements so they can jump around to the most important things on the page. Uh, some folks that might be able to visually see the site or use a mouse um, might be able to move in a different way, but there are screen readers that folks use that enable them to navigate the website. So when you're choosing he heading elements, uh, it's really important that you use them so that folks using screen readers can jump around as well. All right, we have some other text level elements. We have paragraphs, we have spans, we have pre-tags, which are an abomination and you shouldn't use them, right? Paragraphs are for large blocks of text. Paragraphs are for short blocks of text. And pre-tags, what they actually do is they like preserve white space. So like if you like hit enter or you tab or put a lot of spaces, right? That white space is preserved in a pre-tag. Why do you say, why do you think I think a pre-tag is an abomination? I don't like it. Why do you think I might not like the pre-tag? Yeah, to me that white space and that styling, all of that is, that's style. So I don't like that the pre-tag kind of blurs that line of separation of concerns. Actually, let me go ahead and close this fully. Close that fully. Try and use up less resources here. Yeah, I don't like that it preserves that white space. It kind of violates that separation of concerns and I think that's a little weird to me. Uh, here are the nerd fights. <sighs> I'm going to say this on the internet. I'm going to say it live. I've lost a friend over the BR tag, like a legitimate friend. Uh, we were at a, a meetup. Uh, tech meetups are a big thing. Like you can go listen to people talk about technology, drink some beer, eat some free pizza. So we were at a, we were at a meetup. We started talking about the BR tag. I said, you know what? The BR tag introduces a space. To me, that's style. BR tag should be what we call deprecate. We shouldn't use them anymore, right? He disagreed. We had some words, and I haven't talked to this man in three years, four years, all over a BR tag. Now, was I right and he wrong, or him wrong and I right? Not really. These these are nerd fights. Like if you want to read the actual specification, right? You can go to the MDN. The MDN stands for the Mozilla Developers Network. It is hands down the best website for when you're learning HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It will tell you the meaning behind each tag. So if you're coming back through these slides on your own and you're like, hey, what does this tag do? Look it up on the MDN. So one of us might technically be right. But here's something really important. Here's something that's really important when you're starting out as a developer. Have strong opinions held weekly. So you want to formulate opinions like I'm going to do this because I do this. I'm going to do that because I, I believe in this. And, and if somebody presents a better argument, you're willing to change those opinions. But a lot of what we do in web development, there is no 100% correct way. It's going to come down to your judgment and your understanding. So start to formulate these strong opinions and hold on to them. <sighs> BR tag stands for breakup. You know what? If you're watching this video, I don't think you will because you probably hate me. We, we, sh we, sh we shared some words we shouldn't have shared. If you're watching this video, I apologize. I shouldn't have taken it that far about the BR tag. And uh, I would like to be friends again. So if you're watching this, say hello. Let's grab a beer virtually. Uh, and let's put bygones by bygones. Let's be friends again. All right. So I've made my piece. I don't use BR tags. I don't use HR tags. Uh, they violate separation of concerns in my opinion. But I'm probably blatantly wrong and lost a friend over it. Cool. There are some other devices, uh, some other elements that uh, are important and they help things like screen readers. So some individuals use a device 
such as a screen reader, that will read through HTML for them, help them navigate through the browser. Uh, and these, these elements can be really helpful for those individuals. Uh, and they do some really interesting things. If we put an M tag around some content in our HTML, it's actually going to bold it. If we put a strong tag around some content in our HTML, it's going to make it a, sorry, if we put an M tag around content, it's going to italicize it. If we put a strong tag around content, it's going to bold it. Does that violate separation of concerns? If I use a tag to bold or italicize something? I think so, yeah. If I'm going to use these tags to do style, then I have violated separation of concerns, right? But here's the cool thing. I don't care how it renders. I don't care about what the HTML looks like because I haven't written any CSS. So I ignore the bolding. I ignore the italicizing. I use the M and strong tags to provide emphasis and a sense of urgency uh, in my content, specifically for folks that uh, use a screen reader. If they're using a screen reader, they might not be able to see the boldness or italicizing anyway. And that's not the reason I'm using those tags. I'm using those tags because it gives them extra cues as to why certain content might be important. If you're experiencing a, a, a web page uh, that has some CSS, the thing that's urgent is normally going to be like bright and flashing and in your, in your eyes, right? Like you're going to be able to see bright red alerts, things like that. But if you're using a screen reader and maybe have a visual impairment, you might not be able to pick up on those visual cues. So things like the M and strong tag become important for those types of users. All right. We saw an unordered list with the about page. Uh, the sibling to that would be the ordered list. Uh, the ordered list, when you look at it in the browser, gives you numbers. Doesn't matter. You can change that with CSS. An unordered list gives you bullet points. Doesn't matter. You can change that with CSS. Don't pick tags based on how they look. Okay. Now. The ordered list, like I said, is for when your list, if you didn't put it in a list, you'd get into trouble, right? Like, like if you didn't follow that specific order, like making a, making some brownies, right? That's when you should use an ordered list. Like if you're following recipe instructions, that's an ordered list. An ordered list is just for a grouping of items. Doesn't have to be in any particular order. We have some containing elements. Uh, for the longest time, the really only containing element that we had for our content was the div. That was it. With the newer versions of HTML, we got all these wonderful tags that have a more appropriate semantic meaning, like, like a reason why you would use them. The article tag is really important. It's for content that should be shared, right? Think about like blog posts, things that could go out and exist somewhere else other than in the main flow of the page. The other things that we got were like an aside. If you read on the MDN what an aside is for, the aside stands for ancillary or extra content. Things that if you got rid of on a website, the website would still function okay. What is something that you could typically remove from a website and the website would still be okay that might be a good candidate for an aside? Anybody have any ideas? What might be a good candidate for an aside? Yeah, ads, right? Things that if we're a Twitter feed, yeah. Things that are just extra, things that don't add to the content on the site, that would be a good uh, candidate for an aside. Headers for content at the beginning of a document, footer for content at the end of a document. Notice I didn't say top or bottom because that's too close to style. And the trusty old div. Div really lost its semantic meaning because we got all these other wonderful tags that have more reason to when you should use them. So divs kind of went away. If you're following a tutorial that's still using divs and it's not a React tutorial, it might be a little dated. It might not be using the best practices. So be a little careful with that one. So there's a lot of these tags here. And a lot of them have really specific reasons when you're going to use them. 
we're going to work through when we should use those tags together, especially next class, which my computer is not exploding. Uh, and it does seem kind of overwhelming at first. But you have these tags that were here in the slides. Start with those. Try to use those tags most of the time. If you really are curious what the tag does and when you should use it, look it up on the MDN, the Mozilla Developers Network. That's going to give you the best overview as to, um, as to how to use the tag appropriately. Okay. Header versus H1. Yes, that's a very important question. So there are three elements that are very confusing. Header, head, and heading. Okay. The header is for content at the beginning of a document. The headings are elements that describe content that come after it. Think of like the uh, like a newspaper. The 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 main the main headline like the United States goes to space, right? That headline, right? It took me a while to think of a non-controversial headline. Uh, the United States goes to space, right? That headline would be your heading element, H1. Because it's describing the content that's going to come in the article below. Right? Head is for setting up your document. We'll get to that in a second. And header is for content at the beginning of a document. Let's look at some websites and maybe it might be a little bit clearer when we should use uh, different tags. All right? So I am going to take a look at um, resilient coders. This is the free stipendit bootcamp that I run during the day. If we look at this page, what is the most important content on the page? What's the most important content here? Oh, you're trying to get fancy. You're trying to get fancy with the, the terminology here. Yeah, the equity part. Equity and access to the tech economy is definitely the most important content. If, if you came to this website and the only thing that you left with was equity and access to the tech economy, right, that would be the most important thing. So that's why that would be the h1 the equity and access to the tech economy is not the h1 because it's big it's the h1 because it's the most important thing then i wrote css to make it bigger okay so when you're trying to figure out what should be the h1 you're not going to be like oh what's the biggest thing because that that's the wrong way to think about it. you're going to say what's the most important thing and that should be the h1 okay now this whole top area, we might include this top area as the header, content at the beginning of the document, right? We said that this is the H1, okay? We got a block of text here. What would this block of text be? What would that block of text be? What tag would we use for that block of text? Yeah, a paragraph, a paragraph. Cool. Let's scroll a little bit. How about our mission? What is our mission? What tag would you use there? A paragraph, nice. Paragraph, nope. Not a paragraph, H2, right? H2. It's a heading element, and we know it's a heading. We know it's a heading because it describes the content that comes after, right? That our mission describes that paragraph of text that comes after. So that's why it's, a, it's an H2. And it's not an H1 because it's slightly less important than the H1 that we had up here, right? So definitely an H2. That block of text, right? That block of text is our paragraph. Right? How about meet our students? What would meet our students be? What tag do you think that might be? 
Go ahead and put it in chat. Oh, we're, we're getting some mixing here. We have some, we have some folks saying it's still an H2. We have some folks saying it's an H3. So it's going to come down to importance. Do I think meet our students as is as important as let's scroll up as our mission? Like, are they of equal importance? And I'm going to say, yes, they are of equal importance. And the reason being is I want folks to hire these students, right? So that's really important to me. So that's going to be another, I'm going to say another H2. Okay. We got another block of text underneath of it. So another paragraph, um, we have a button or an anchor tag. Like it could just be a link that looks like a button and let's keep scrolling. Our alumni are employed by companies like, like this. What would you say that is that, that, that text right there, our alumni are employed. What's that to you? What tag would you use here? Yeah, I think that's an H3, maybe an H4. I say it's an H3. It's definitely less important and we don't have enough information to figure out the total importance, but it's definitely less important. So I would feel comfortable with an H3 there for now. How about all of these? It's kind of funny to say, but these would be what? The things I'm circling are all individual what? Go ahead and put it in chat. Yeah, they're images. Uh, we actually have an image tag in HTML. It's just IMG. Uh, and so each of those images are just image tags. Uh, let's go all the way to the bottom. Let's get a little tricky here. All right, so we're at the end of the document. That's the keyword. We're at the end of the document. So this whole thing at the end of the document would be our what? Talked very briefly about it in the containing elements. Yeah, it's the footer, the footer. Cool. And then now here's the, here's the super tricky one. This right here, get involved. Get involved is definitely a what? Get involved is a what? What would you say get involved is? What's get involved? Yeah, I think it's like an H4. It's definitely less important. It's definitely an H4. Definitely less important. And then the tricky thing though is what's below the H4? What is that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> HP Dragon, Dragonet got it first, right? It's a list. It's definitely a list. What kind of list? What kind of list would you say that is? Unordered. Yep, I agree. It's an unordered list. Cool. So you've been on the job a total of what? Just a little over two hours. And you already know pretty much enough to lay out a pretty modern website. So... Yes, there are a lot of HTML tags, but there's really only like 20 that you'll use on a really regular basis that you have to be comfortable with. And so on Discord, I'm going to share the list of the most important tags. Uh, and so you can you can work through that. The other resource I really recommend is the MDN. I'm about to fly to Google. I love it. Uh, is the MDN, right? The MDN has a really great list of all these tags, when to use them and how to use them. So the thing I want you to see here is that we were, we were, no, don't leave. Uh, we were able to, whoop, we were able to lay out this website, right? We were able to lay out this website with maybe like five or six tags that we already knew. And it's really not more than that. So the homework I'm going to give you is going to be exploring some of these tags so that when we come together on uh, Thursday, we have an understanding of some tags and we can start building. All right, let's go back to the slides. Let's finish this up. And then I'm gonna introduce the lab and then we're gonna break for the night. Uh, so I'll go ahead and for the boot campers, I'll create, there's already a study together channel, um, but I'll create a study group channel on Discord for you all. That way all the mentors and stuff can hop in and help as well. 
Uh, so we'll, we'll just create it inside of the Discord channel. That way folks can stay connected easier. All right. So let's talk real quickly about some deprecated tags, uh, and then we're going to bring it home. All right. So there is this survey. I tried really hard to find it. I couldn't find it, but I, I, I've witnessed this survey. I want to say it is a Stack Overflow survey, um, but basically it asked, hey, where did you get your start as a developer? Anybody want to guess what the number one answer was for how folks got start, their start as a developer? Anybody want to guess what the number one answer was? Take a guess. Put it in chat. What do you think the number one the number one way people got started as a developer? A lot of you are guessing MySpace. That was the number two reason. The number one reason people got started with software engineering, according to that survey, was Neopets. Neopets was the reason they became a software engineer. Uh, Neopets was my jam back in the day. Basically, you had like this pet, you could play mini games with them, you took care of them. Mine's probably long dead by now. Um, but it was really fun back in the day. And you had like this store that you could customize. And uh, a lot of software engineers got their start by customizing those stores. The number two response was MySpace. Uh, most software engineers got their start uh, by building out their tricked out MySpace pages. And they're like, whoa, this is really cool. If I can do this, what else can I do? The sad part about all of this is that a lot of the tags that we used to use, we can't use anymore. They're what we call deprecated. The blink tag, the marquee tag, things that would like shine and scroll, uh, they're all no longer able to be used. Why do you think all those tags that we use, like blink and marquee and bolding and italicizing, are no longer used? Why are they deprecated? Yeah, it's it's CSS. Those are those are all CSS, right? And so, as the newer versions of HTML came out, uh, we got rid of some tags. And some tags were co-opted to mean slightly different things. Like the B and I tags are still technically around, but they're not used to bold or italicize stuff anymore. Cool. Excuse me. Here's what the structure of your HTML should look like. Uh, you're gonna have the doc type up top, and that's gonna enable you to realize uh, like what kind of version of HTML you're using. So this very plain doc type is a clear HTML five. Then we have an HTML element that opens and closes. And then inside that HTML element, we have the two really important ones, the head and the body. The head is where you're gonna put all the things that the browser needs, right? All the things that the browser needs to do its job, okay? Then the body is gonna be where you put all of the HTML that you want the users to see. So if the users can see or interact with something, it's going to go into the body, okay? So, the way I remember this is that you can't see what's going on inside my head, but you can see my sexy body. Let that burn into your skull. Can't see what's going on inside my head, but you can see what's happening with my sexy body, right? That way, the users can see what's in the body, but they traditionally can't see what's in the head. The head's just really setting stuff up, bodies for what the users see. So if it's an H1, if it's a paragraph, if it's a span, if it's an anchor tag, if it's a section, if it's a div, it's all going to go inside of the body. So for your lab today, you could copy this structure and all of the text I gave you, right? All the text I gave you uh, would go inside that body. Okay. Cool. So now it's lab time. And instead of kind of staying live with you all to work through the lab together, I'm going to ask for you to do it on your own. Uh, and to come back on Thursday when I have my computer that's not going to overheat and explode. Uh, so for the lab, I have given you 
a brownies.html file. And this HTML file just has a lot of content, a lot of tags, okay? A lot of tags to be used. Uh, there are no tags to start, and it's your job to wrap every single bit of content in what you believe is the best HTML element, okay? So for the current boot campers, this is gonna be due next Tuesday. So you're gonna work on it, and then you're gonna submit it next Tuesday. Uh, if you're in the current boot camp, you will get access to me grading your stuff. Uh, for folks that wanna follow along, go ahead, work on it on your own, and I'll release the solution on Discord as well so that you can compare yours to mine, okay? We'll probably have some differences. All right. This is kind of where I wanna stop for today. Normally class will go for about three hours and it will traditionally be less me talking and uh, more us actually coding, but there's a lot of little stuff to get through today and, and some, some hiccups, okay? Uh, yeah, you can post your lab on Discord. Uh, if folks, if folks um, post it, I'll keep a channel. If you want it, you can ask questions. My, my goal is to be super committed to anyone that joins the Discord and needs help, right? I have the current boot campers that are gonna get my full undivided attention, but anyone that is looking for that community that might help them or push them or support them, myself and all of the friends that we call them, the mentors in the channel are here to help you. Uh, we realized that for a lot of folks that replied, over 2,000 of you, like this is a really hard, difficult time. You're trying to explore a new career and we really wanna help you through that, okay? So if you've been watching and following along uh, and you haven't followed the stream, please go ahead and click follow for me uh, just so you get a notification next time class starts. If you haven't joined the Discord, go ahead and join. That way we can help out. Uh, yeah, I think images would be good. And I'm gonna hang out for a few minutes and answer any questions that you might have in chat. But this is where we're gonna stop. Uh, go ahead and open up that HTML file, wrap all the content in the appropriate tags, and come Thursday, we'll take a glance at it again, uh, and we'll, we'll start fresh. This has been a lot of fun. I'm sorry we had some technical hiccups, but I'm going to work really hard uh, tonight and tomorrow to make sure that doesn't happen again uh, so the stream's not interrupted and there's no, no bad issues. Yeah, let's, I'm just, I'm just gonna hang out. I'm gonna hang out for five, 10 minutes. Uh, any questions that you might have, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, if you're in the current bootcamp, you're gonna submit those on Schoology. Uh, and Thursday, we'll, we'll play around with Adam. We'll get you comfortable using Adam opening it. So if you don't feel comfortable, uh, jump on Discord. Uh, I'm also gonna run office hours on Saturdays. So those would be really good times. If you're just having like really strong te technical difficulties, stop by the office hours on Saturdays. That'll be a chance for you to like actually kind of go into uh, fixing things that you're struggling with. Hey, I hope you all had some fun. I hope you learned a few things. Uh, it's been really fun kind of putting this all together, putting the slides and getting you all into the Discord. Uh, I really appreciate you stopping by and, and learning some stuff with me. Like I said, I'm going to run this multiple times. So it's just only going to get better from here. And I really appreciate you being the first folks to go through it, uh, paving the way for everyone that comes after you. <laughs> My space kittens. Yeah, so we'll end it here. Feel free to kind of dip out. I'm going to let kind of chat run for a little bit. Um, If you have questions, feel free to ask questions. No problem, everybody. Thank you for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. See everyone Thursday. See everyone Thursday. If you had a question uh, I didn't get a chance to answer, go ahead and ask that uh, question now. Uh, for those that are in the current boot camp, um, I haven't opened the assignment yet. Uh, the assignment will always open on the day that it's due. Uh, so don't worry about sending it right now. Yep. If you're in the Discord, you're going to see folks that are in green. Uh, those are the mentors that are there to help. Uh, they they want to help. They're, they're inspired by you kind of 
wanting to, to learn how to code and here to help. A lot of them are uh, Resilient Coders alumni, folks that have been in the same place you are right now that went through a boot camp and now are software engineers at some really big companies. In your atom, you had a very long line displayed as a block. How did I make that happen? Uh, since it was saved as an HTML file, when I clicked on it, it gave me that highlighting. Yeah. Hey, Noct, glad to have you, even though you've only been here for 10 minutes. Uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, starting at 6.30 Eastern time, come learn some code. Uh, the downloadable slides file, Izzy, is on the Discord in the follow along uh, materials. It's follow along materials. If you go there, you'll get the starter code from today and the, um, and the lab files. Uh, do we just message any of the mentors? Yeah, they're there. If you're on discord, you'll see who's online, uh, ping them in like general or coding help. And we're here to help. Can we get some practice games challenge you to some high stakes Pokemon showdown match? Yes, I play v VGC doubles though. I don't play singles. So if you play like singles OU, that's not my jam. You wanna play some VGC doubles, let's go. I'm ready to throw down. Oh no, you're starting your, uh, your schedule at Amazon. Sorry to hear that. Uh, glad you had some fun. I hope you have a good day at work. Hope it's not too stressful. Uh, Panda captures photos. To open the HTML document, you can either drag the file to Adam or go to Adam and click on uh, File, Open, and then the, n the name of that file. And it should open it, Adam, for you. <laughs> RC for life, for sure, Ellie. Do you usually start with HTML when building something? Yes, I always start with HTML. Uh, it just helps me kind of get my thoughts organized and then I'll typically wrap some CSS around it, some JavaScript uh, and go from there. Yes, uh, super. The HTML docs are in the follow along materials channel. Uh, I'll pin them every week, every, every class it'll be there. Uh, the flow, yes, I'm going to edit it very quickly just to kind of get out any inconsistencies or things that I might have misspoke on, uh, and then it'll be up on YouTube. Are there any local, local meetups or plans for them? Uh, most of our folks, especially a lot of the mentors, are based in Boston. Uh, and so once COVID's not a thing anymore, uh, I'm sure folks would uh, be down to meet up in person. Uh, also, Free Code Camp has really great... Um, local meetups. I used to go to the one in Boston for a little while and help folks learn how to code. <laughs> Everyone's turned off by my Pokemon now that I know now that I know I play VGC doubles. Yeah, uh, sorry to hit 1230 to 730. You're a trooper. Jeez. How do you save the file with HTML on Atom? Uh, you can do file save or command S or control S to save. And then uh, just name the file .html. So whatever you want to call it .html, and then you'll have an HTML file. <laughs> uh, do <laughs> Domino's Pizza <laughs> USA said, great work. Domino's would sponsor. <laughs> I love it. Have you had anyone relocate for your Resilient Coders camp? Yes, we've had quite a few people um, Rai Rai, who's a mentor uh, on the Discord, he, he came from uh, Detroit and uh, has now been very successful in his career, uh, worked as a software engineer at one of the largest publishing houses in the country and is now uh, an instructor at General Assembly as well. Uh, Little Bonnie, yeah, if you just if you go to leonnoel.com slash YouTube, that'll take you to my YouTube channel. If you also just do exclamation point YouTube, you'll get the link for it here in chat. Um, the Resilient Coders Bootcamp is uh, in person. We try to make it in person or at least folks that are currently residing in Boston. We are virtual now, um, but we do try to keep it for folks in Boston because that's where our funders fund us for. But uh, 
there are plenty of other kind of ways that you could, if you're out of the country, uh, hit me up on Discord. Happy to help with learning plans, places to learn, stuff like that. Is it possible to find a job with basic HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for like an entry level position? Yes, but it's gonna be very, very hard and you're gonna have to be good at JavaScript. I always recommend folks learn full stack development, meaning that you learn the code that runs on the server and the client and then apply for roles, even if they are just front end roles. Uh, you could be just basic HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but you're gonna have to be really comfortable with JavaScript. Like you're gonna have to be really good at like um, coding challenges, leak codes, code wars, those types of things. Uh, and then yeah, you could get one a job with just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but I really recommend you, you learn at least a little bit full stack first. Uh, Johnny Proton, I am not familiar with any nonprofit boot camps. Um, there are a lot of boot camps that charge money. I'm not really sure of any. I know there's one in Pittsburgh, um, but I think we're pretty rare. Uh, we're working on that, though, hopefully. Like I said, I'm just going to hang out for maybe another four or five minutes. Uh, let chat kind of wind down. If you have any questions, happy to answer them, and then we'll kind of go go off in a couple couple minutes. I see a lot of automation engineer jobs that use using frameworks like Selenium. What does that usually require? Uh, there are a lot of specialty roles that require a little bit of programming and then more domain knowledge. That's one of them to where, yes, coding is a part of what you do, but it's kind of knowing the ecosystem around the, the type of code that you write that's really important. Um, Selenium is a, a pretty cool framework for automating stuff. Like that's, we call it headless, meaning like, imagine you're doing something in the browser. Um, Selenium can mimic the stuff that you're doing in the browser uh, without you actually having to move a mouse and keyboard. So like if you want to write like a sneaker bot, right? Like, like a new sneaker drops and you want to buy it immediately, you could use it to like automate that process. Uh, but a lot of companies use it for way more complex things than that. Yeah. Uh, what is your take on ISAs? I hate them. Uh, I think for a lot of people, they're unclear how much money you're going to spend. Um, for some folks, though, that might be the only opportunity or way into a paid boot camp. And like I said, if you figured out that a paid boot camp is for you, all right, then there you go. I just, I, I just think a lot of people sell a dream, uh, and that dream is easier to sell when there's no money up front. Uh, but you got to be careful before signing up for a boot camp. That's all. If you, if you're careful, you've done your research, you figured out they're getting jobs. Um, then yeah, go for it. What are your thoughts on SAS? Uh, I use SAS. Uh, SAS is just a, a great way of like adding programmatic elements to your CSS. I'm a fan. Uh, I recommend building one application before starting to apply for jobs. So like something that has a nice front end that you can see and interact with and something that has also a back end component where you're like the server, like the, the server that's listening for the request, storing stuff into a database. Uh, yeah. And a, and a portfolio, a portfolio can be helpful just to have a web presence. So when people start Googling you, when you apply for jobs, they find something. Uh, what are your, some of your favorite and least favorite aspects of coding? Uh, my favorite thing about coding is being able to bring something to life. Like I can have an idea and if I spend a really hard weekend, right? If I spend like a really rough weekend, I can build that thing that's in my head. That blows my mind. Like to be able to, the, the creativity that knowing how to code provides is endless. Uh, and so that's my favorite thing about um, coding. My least favorite thing about coding. Hmm. I kind of like coding a lot. <laughs> uh, least favorite. I think my least favorite thing right now is, um, especially in JavaScript land, there's so many new frameworks and it's really, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 uh, it's hard to stay up to date and current all the new things that are happening. 
I kind of sometimes wish wish I chose a more boring stack where I could develop way more depth and not try to keep up with whatever is currently in vogue. I think that's more of a complaint of me like loving JavaScript. Yeah, I said that. Love JavaScript. Uh, what to start if you want to learn Clojure and Ruby? For Ruby, you cannot beat Mark Hartle's book. Um, it's the 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 Ruby on Rails fifth, uh, sixth edition now book. Uh, Mark Hartle. You, you can't beat anything. Than, that's just the best full stop. Closure. Uh, I'm not too sure. I have some resources ear, earmarked, but you'd have to ping me on Discord. I can show you what I found when I was looking into it. <laughs> uh, enter, yes, I am in a real spaceship. Don't tell anyone. Uh, no, I have a green screen behind me. That way I can have the code behind me. And this is a GIF I found by Googling Zoom, Zoom background GIFs on Giphy. You mentioned that 50% from, uh, and that's particularly my boot camp, don't get jobs. Um, it's, that's a really tough question. For some folks, they put in so much steam to make it through that they just don't have anything left in the tank uh, to cross that job finish line. The finding the job process is just as hard as the learning to code process. And that's something people just don't tell you about. Like my students put in hours of work each day to find that right opportunity. Uh, and so I think some folks just kind of run out of gas. Some folks get to the end and realize that it's not for them. It's just like it took them the whole boot camp to realize that software engineering wasn't the career for them. Uh, and then some folks just have some other th things that they're dealing with that make them not be able to cross the finish line. Very rarely do we have folks that keep it up, keep pushing and don't actually get the job. It might take a little bit longer. Uh, like most of our folks find their opportunities within the first two months. Um, for some folks, it takes them three months plus to find that right opportunity. Uh, and so really it's just not giving up. I am in Canada, so is it more tough to get a job here? Uh, I'm not actually sure. Uh, I know there are some tech hubs in Canada. Uh, what I would do is I would look on sites like uh, Indeed and Glassdoor and, and see if there are open positions. Um, take a look, get to know your local market. Uh, so I, I personally don't have children, um, but how do you structure learning and juggling um, on top of a regular job? Um, Gary Vaynerchuk, and uh, it's up to you whether uh, you're a fan or not, but Gary Vaynerchuk has this, this saying that I really, I really like. Uh, he says it's not about how many hours you have, it's what you do with those hours that counts. I can give five people uh, a, a one hour block of time, and those five different people are gonna work at varying different degrees of, of focus in that, in that hour block of time. So if you can only find an hour, build a realistic plan around getting an hour in each day. I'm really happy to help with that. If you're, if you're working and you have children and you want a plan that's gonna be tailored around like making that work, ping me on Discord or grab a time slot, um, leonnoel.com slash book hyphen time. Well, let's talk through it. As a Pokemon master, I'm picking Bulbasaur all day long. Uh, I'm actually really mad that I have Charizard as my um, follow alert. Uh, I am definitely working on getting a Bulbasaur one. How international is coding? Are there languages? Uh, uh, is, is there a language barrier in different countries with regard to coding? Uh, so the, the real answer to that is that pretty much all major jobs are going to be in English. Like most coding languages use English as the default language. Um, there are programming languages and other languages. They're just not dominant. So if you're going to write code, you're going to be writing code primarily in a community that primarily speaks English. Um, there are some other smaller projects, but it's just the reality that currently it's mainly English. How much time to learn JavaScript for an average person? Um, I would say, well, so let's take a look at the, the bootcamp that I help run during the day, right? 
Uh, those folks put in 12 hour days for 20 weeks before they're able to get their opportunities. If you just want to learn the basics, you can pick up the basics in a couple, like a weekend or two. Um, you find a good tutorial and you can pick up the basics pretty quickly. Uh, but to get to the point to where somebody will employ you, that's, that's a different story. Any sites you recommend for website inspiration? Uh, yeah, so a lot, a lot of designers hang out on Dribbble. I hang out on Product Hunt a lot to see new sites. Um, yeah, I read Hacker News a lot and Reddit too. And I see a lot of stuff on their, on their different subreddits there. Uh, Tune 2022. I, I gotta look up in my uh, in my notes. If you just send me a message on Discord, I'll I'll follow up with your message on Discord and send you the tutorial. Bip, uh, no worries, no worries. Uh, Nico, what are your favorite shows, movies, podcasts with topics on coding or just for pleasure? Um. My favorite podcast, I have two favorite podcasts. Uh, Syntax by Wes Boss is amazing. Uh, his tutorials are also amazing. I highly recommend, especially all of his free ones. Uh, top notch. Uh, and then the podcast that I've listened to the most uh, is Shop Talk Show. Uh, Shop Talk Show by Chris Coyer runs CSS Tricks. Uh, the people behind CodePen. Uh, just an amazing podcast. Good group of folks that come on and really dives deep with a lot of stuff. Tips on how to strengthen your logic. Um, it'll come. Coding is like learning a, a new language. Uh, a lot of folks get frustrated early on because they're like, hey, Leon, I've been studying for two weeks and I'm not fluent yet. You wouldn't say that about any other language. If you were an English speaker learning Japanese, after two months, you wouldn't be upset that you weren't fluent in Japanese. Uh, treat programming languages as the same thing. It'll come, don't worry. Do a code challenges, maybe do some code wars once you have the basics down. It'll come. All right, it looks like those are the, uh, the sec that second podcast was Shop Talk Show. How to strengthen your critical thinking for coding. Code challenges, I'm all about it. I do a code challenge every day. Um, I really like Code Wars. I'm all, I also do leak codes, but I find the, the puzzles on Code Wars to be more entertaining. Python versus JavaScript, which is more in demand? JavaScript, full stop. We, we, we try to get hundreds of people hired. You're gonna have a way easier time getting hired for JavaScript than you will with Python. Uh, and there's two, there's two reasons why that, that's true. Uh, one, there's just more demand right now for JavaScript, but two, Nobody teaches four-year CS programs in JavaScript. Like none of the big schools teach JavaScript as their main language. There are schools that use Python though. So when you're going into the job market, do you want to go up against four-year CS grads or do you want to go up against folks that even if they do have a four-year CS degree, they've had to learn on their own. And that's why JavaScript is also really important. Ah, so you gotta be careful, JavaScript, not Java though. Java is a different language. All right. Any last minute questions before we uh, sign off here? All right, folks. Hey, it's been wonderful. I really appreciate you stopping by for the, the first class. Uh, if you have questions between now and Thursday, hit me up on Discord. Happy to answer them. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, looking forward to seeing everyone on Thursday. If you haven't hit the follow button, go hit the follow button for me just so you can see next time we're online. And I'll talk to you on Discord. Peace, everyone.